and there this little uh, one page uh, is something of a guide to it. That's that's all I have right now. Be, before we <clears throat> get to the point where we're, we're rushing to the airport, I thought it'd be um, important now to, to talk about scheduling the next meeting so we get some sense of uh, people's calendars while everyone is here. <clears throat> I think uh, I've, I've heard from several that, that June is, is out. Um, uh, how about July? Is <coughs> That uh, out of the question for anyone. Paul. Chris? Okay. Early July. Ogre? Late July. Okay. So, Mike, do you want to have someone from your office try to schedule a specific time? Zone? Well, you we know, if, if, we're, if we're able to do it now, okay. uh, uh, we're probably three yes, days. I think so. Well, um, yeah. Uh, but also, we, we have a lot of stuff on the disks that, yeah. that I think will be really generate some questions. That, <coughs> so. Is it yeah, the is it, the, is it the July meeting when we will have people coming in and talking I, to us? Yeah, that's, uh, that's the plan. And, uh, you know, I think we, we do have a lot of data uh, available. It's just we haven't had a chance to absorb it all. Um, and I think that we can certainly try to have, uh, have something by, well, we'll have something by then. So is the third week better than the fourth week? Okay, third week. Fourth is better. Twenty-sixth. Uh -huh. Last week is not as good as the third week. Vern, if we had it toward the end of that third week, would that help? We had the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. People have to fly in on the 20th, some of us. I think it's important that you be here, so. So we, we drop down to the 26th. What what are the issues, Hoger, for you? 26 to 28 would be okay. Would be okay. Yeah. And Paul? 
All right. Okay. So let's um, let's schedule it for the 26th, 27th, and 28th. And now the I guess the question is if you have uh, the testimony on the 26th and then meet the have a regular meeting the next two days. Yes, I think that would be the okay. strategy. Okay. Okay, so moving on, um, <clears throat> we were going to discuss today um, a point that Byrne brought up about, uh, you know, what is acceptable risk and, and uh, how are we going to uh, deal with it, specifically in terms of endpoints. But before we do that, um, Andreas was going to make a, a presentation that hopefully will enlighten us in this discussion. Do you have anything to? Oh, do you? If it'll, will it fit here? It might be. I might have to take the mouse. Just to let you all know, this is being recorded. So, when you speak, please turn on your microphone and speak into the microphone. Thank you. We'll work the slides, or I can do it. Uh, the red button is the pointer. Arrows. Can I speak into this microphone? Right. Yes. So I thought I um, start off by uh, talking a little about the general background of our work, some mixture data, and then our little attempt at cumulative risk assessment, which, um, as you will see, will probably, will most definitely show up the data gaps and problems which we have, but may be also useful for illustrating a way forward. So this is uh, just the uh, uh, reminder. Um, our work is motivated by investigating um, the role of chemical exposures in what is called the testicular dysgenesis syndrome. This is a a concept developed by Sharp and Skakebeck. Um, there is at the moment in Europe, uh, and I gather here in the US as well, great concern about uh, disease trends for uh, non-descending testes, cryptorchidisms. The trend is going up in Europe as well. Poor semen quality in uh, parts of Europe, the semen quality in young men approaches uh, crisis proportions. They have, um, uh, according to a study which was carried out uh, as part of an EU project with, uh, which I coordinated, it was found that 20% of young Germans, 18 to 19 year olds, have uh, semen, num uh, um, semen numbers below 20 million per milliliter, which is the official uh, limit uh, by WHO, where you can require assisted uh, fertilization. So this is not good, and later in life it ain't going to get better. So there's great concern about that. Then we have um, hyperspadias. This is a malformation of the penis, as you know, where the urethral opening is on the underside of the gland's penis and not at the top, as it should be. And finally, testis cancer, that's also going up in Europe. 
in parts or leveling off at a fairly high level. And Skakebeck and Sharp have proposed that all these disorders are indicative of a malfunctioning of uh, androgen programming in fetal life. So they all go back to a, to a problem during development uh, related to androgen insufficiency. Let me clarify, they say that not all cases of, say, hyperspadia have to do with what they term the testicular dysgenesis syndrome. Not all of them. There are, in particular with hyperspadias, uh, some well-defined genetic disorders which lead to these problems. That's not necessarily to do with the TDS. But the concept I propose has been very fruitful in uh, directing research. So it is really, that is what's uh, the summary of a lot of research both here in the US and in Europe, is that the action of um, fetal androgens makes a man a man. So if there are problems with fetal androgen action, the affected individuals show signs of feminization. So uh, there is one... Uh, so we know now that certain chemicals can disrupt hormone action in fetal life by either blocking the receptor, the androgen receptor, or by suppressing uh, sex hormone synthesis. And this leads to demasculinization. And we have um, in the rat a very good model that is able to recapitulate all, well, three of the disorders that make up the testicular dysgenesis syndrome. Uh, only it is impossible to um, study testicular cancer in the rat, which has to do with when the spermatocytes mature in, in a rat's life. But all the other elements of the testicular dysgenesis syndrome can be recapitulated in the rat. And they, the male offspring of uh, females treated with certain chemicals then show signs of demasculinization. The problem is, um, or the question, definitely this model has relevance to human because the programming um, in fetal life is basically the same in, in, um, in these mammals and in humans. The question that uh, is not resolved is uh, do chemicals really play a role in these adverse disease trends in the human? Now, uh, here a little jump to uh, uh, how toxicology would assess chemicals normally. Um, Here's the example of vinclozolin, that's a pesticide uh, often fi found in red wine. It is a, a fungicide. Um, so people who love red wines from Italy have, you can show the traces of, of that pesticide in their, in their urine, the breakdown products you will find. Um, vinclozolin is one uh, well-studied uh, chemical in this rat model, and... Uh, Typically, uh, demasculinizing effects are seen at doses around 5 milligram per kilogram body weight per day. That is the dose to the uh, pregnant female. The human exposures are, in Europe at least, in this range, uh, which you can, uh, if you divide uh, the human exposure by the dose that leads to first effects in the rat or just not effect, you can see there's a margin of safety, as it is called, of between 200 to 1,000. And at this point, most um, regulatory toxicologists would say, fine, case closed, no case to answer, move over. But there is the issues of toxic cocktails, as it is called, or mixtures, or exposure to combined chemicals or many chemicals simultaneously. And the question that has inspired a lot of our work during the last 10 years is, can chemicals that are safe on their own, if you like, gang up in our bodies uh, to produce effects that cannot be anticipated by studying those chemicals in isolation? And secondly, are these effects predictable if we know the potency of the individual players? And here's a quick summary I'll take you through in stages through 
uh, some key findings relevant to our work here. First of all, there's this landmark paper by uh, Earl Grace Group, uh, How to Sell a Tal. It came out in 2008, which shows that phthalates, combination of phthalates, act uh, additively in producing uh, mixture effects. The endpoint they, um, sorry, the endpoint they looked at was um, testosterone production. So here you see these are. Uh, these gray lines are individual dose response curves, the regression models for the five phthalates, how the cell al studied. So you see here, as we escalate the dose, the uh, testosterone uh, synthesis goes down in fetal life. Um, they prepared a mixture of these five uh, phthalates uh, at a certain mixture ratio. And then using those gray curves, it is possible to construct what the predicted combined effect of these five phthalates should look like. It is for a mixture of specific mixture ratio. And then that's a very strong heuristic tool because it, uh, you can design the mixture experiment on the basis of this prediction. And that's what uh, Howard Salenthal did. And these are the observations. And they match fairly well what can be predicted uh, on the basis of the individual um, dose response curves. The conclusion from this was that these five phthalates act together in a dose additive fashion to produce uh, suppressions of testosterone synthesis. Uh, maybe a little word about what dose addition is. There are two competing models in by which such additivity predictions can be calculated or constructed. One is called dose addition. It works on the assumption that uh, one equi-effective dose of one component in the mixture can be uh, replaced by a, the equi-effective fraction of another one. The concept uh, finds wide use in the uh, application of TCDD equivalence factors for evaluating the oxygen mixtures. The competing concept would be called independent action, or some people call it response addition. And this, there are other considerations and other approaches going into this. Put simply, this model works on uh, stochastic principles and assumes that each chemical uh, does what it does in a fashion independent from all the others. Mathematically, these two concepts are, are different but often they produce the same, exactly the same prediction for uh, certain mixtures. So, for example, in this case here, uh, you could calculate uh, an additivity prediction for independent action and it would sit very closely uh, uh, near the dose addition prediction. That under certain circumstances, these two predictions would diverge. The question then is uh, which of those two competing models can approximate the observed mixture effects best. So far, as you will see in this area of study, um, the answer is that dose addition is fairly useful. So that, that's the first landmark paper. Um, <coughs> we, um, in t together with Ola Hasse's group in uh, Copenhagen, the Danish Te Technical University, have spent a lot of time studying these chemicals in a, sim in a rat developmental toxicity model. This slide just shows you briefly uh, how this experiment is designed. This here is the lifeline of a female pregnant rat, so they get pregnant here. Um, dosing begins on gestational day seven, and normally throughout the entire pregnancy through birth up until postnatal day 16. Then here is, they give birth to offspring, typically six males and six females. And here's the lifeline of the young male rat. Very early after birth, um, the anal genital distance is measured. Uh, that can be done in a, in a non-invasive fashion, so these little rats live on. Then um, a little later, on postnatal day 16, uh, samples are taken, some are sacrificed, and the organ weights are measured uh, of organs that are under the control of androgen action, so for example the prostate and various other sex accessory organs. 
Um, and also, malformations of the penis are uh, uh, evaluated. And then later, that's the at postnatal day 47, uh, malformations of the penis are looked at again. So we lo would look at things that re recapitulate hyperspadias in humans. So here's the first result of, of a long study which we conducted. Um, we looked at, this was really, uh, the intention of this experiment was not to model environmentally relevant exposures. We just wanted to um, refine the tools. It has never been done before at the time. We needed to know whether androgen receptor antagonists produce mixture effects in a predictable fashion. So they were selected, these players here is vinclozolin, flutamide and prosimidone. These two are pesticides, flutamide is a drug. They were selected in terms of uh, their effectiveness and their mechanism. So this is, if you like, a lab mixture, nothing to do with environmental exposures, but this was terribly important to us to verify certain concepts. So what you see here is a dose-response curve for anogenital index here. You see how uh, with dose escalation, these, uh, the offspring gets more and more feminized. Uh, maybe I... no, that's fine. Now, this is the outcome of the mixture experiment. Uh, the green curve is what was anticipated on the basis of these individual dose-response curves for a mixture with specific mixture ratio. And what you see here, these uh, dots are the observations. Uh, the black dots, the outcome from individual litters. The red dots, the overall litter means. And we were quite stunned how well the observations matched what was predicted. Again, this shows that these three androgen receptor antagonists work together in a dose additive fashion. So step three, um, we then looked, and this paper came out very recently last year in EHP, just uh, before Christmas. Um, we became interested in looking at um, combinations of antiandrogens that work in a totally, that work in, by mechanisms that are very different. So finasteride, for example, blocks the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Vinclozolin uh, blocks the androgen receptor, as we've seen. DEHP uh, interferes with testosterone synthesis. And Prochloras is a mixture. It uh, is able to antagonize the androgen receptor, but also interferes with some important enzymes in steroidogenesis. Um, what we did was uh, study the individual dose response curves of all these players again, and then mixed at a certain ratio. And this is what happened uh, with respect to a multitude of endpoints, anogenital distance. This is musculus leviator ani, that's a funny muscle that's also under the control of uh, androgens in development, uh, nipple retention and prostate weight. And what you see here in green again are the predicted curves according to dose addition and the blobs here what we observed. And again, uh, with these layers here that work in a dissimilar fashion, uh, there was good agreement with dose addition. In this particular case, let me say that the um, predictions based on independent action were actually congruent with, with those for dose addition. Now we were very pleased, but now comes the one result which throws a spanner in the works and which I personally hate, but there it is. Penile malformations, you remember at this very last time point, postnatal day 47. Here we have, uh, we constructed a prediction window, if you like. This is uh, what we expect on the basis of independent action. This is one very conservative prediction based on dose addition. So the, the, and these here in blue is what was really observed. So you see a shift towards lower doses with this very endpoint, a very important endpoint, penile malformation. This shift here, uh, if you project it down onto the dose axis, is, is probably not very large. It's a factor of four or five. 
with respect to here, this is larger, it's nearly an order of magnitude. But what is a uh, little disturbing is that in a dose range where basically all the models predict that nothing much should happen, the observations show us that we're near maximal effect. That is because these dose response curves are so steep. We concluded that this is a synergism, but we can offer no mechanistic explanation as to why this should be when all the other endpoints are essentially dose additive. Maybe there's something about penile development which we don't quite understand. Also, it seems to us that the, in this case here, the presence of phthalates and other players sensitize the tissue to the effects of vinclozolin. Vinclozolin is by, if uh, I haven't shown the individual dose response curves, but vinclozolin is the only player in this mixture that will give a complete dose response curve with penile malformation. All the others give curves that are sort of stumps, a little stump. So, as I say, we don't like this very much ourselves because it throws a spanner into this predictive predictive approach, but it has to be reported. Um, yes, because but, it's you, uh, Chris. Thank you. So the, the, the dot there is on the high level is the, uh, yeah. the, the mean, the sample mean? Yeah. And the bar is what? That these are confidence uh, intervals. Confidence intervals. How many observations at, in each dose group do you remember? Yeah, quite a few. Um, I don't... I don't remember off the top of my head, but we normally looked at between six and ten litters, and each litter has five male offspring. But some of them were sacrificed before that, so I really have to look it up how many. But I'm just wondering, because in the previous slides you had dots for actual observations. Yeah. The actual observations here, did, did, were there some animals that were lower or did they all sort of cluster up where the confidence interval is? Well, they, they uh, clustered up pretty much here, you know, otherwise you wouldn't get, you know, you didn't have, at this point, you didn't have an animal that was down here. Okay, so just a resume of uh, what we found so far that we've, we've also, I'm not showing you this here, we've done a lot of work with mixtures of estrogenic chemicals in, in vitro and also with fish. So we have joint effects with uh, mixed mode of action antiandrogens, and that's quite important because there's this myth out there in the regulatory world and otherwise that uh, says people think that combination effects are only to be expected with chemicals that uh, show a similar mode of action. This is uh, evidently not borne out by our empirical observations. Combined effects are always greater than the effects of the most toxic chemical in the mixture. And this leads us to think that the usual chemical by chemical approach to risk assessment may lead to underestimations of risk. I say may, not necessarily in all cases, but uh, we can de define parameters where underestimations of risks are likely. That's particularly when we're dealing with uh, mixtures uh, of many components, more than 10. Right. Um, let's, these are what follows now. This is the empirical results. Uh, I thought it might be useful so you have a feel of what's possible now in the area of mixture toxicology. Now the question, how can we approach reality and how can we make use of that in uh, risk assessment. When you want to do this, the first question uh, we have to face is how are we grouping chemicals? Which chemicals do you want to consider together in risk assessment? There are mechanistic criteria, so that's out there, that's very much discussed by EPA, um, by other regulatory agencies in Europe. Uh, you can say, um, I group chemicals that show a similar mechanism or mode of action. But the question then is, how narrow do you want to be? And what precisely do you mean by mode of action? There's a discussion about it. To a large degree, pretty fruitless, in my opinion. 
The alternative would be uh, to adapt a phenomenological criterion by saying uh, purity, uh, regardless of mechanisms or the details of mechanisms, uh, we should group according to similar adverse outcomes. So this is, for example, the approach that uh, the Salad report of the National Research Council has taken. So the question then becomes uh, which chemicals can cause demasculinizing effects in male offspring, and let's group those together, regardless of the details of mechanism and mode of action. The question then is, um, and that concerns a lot of people, are we not casting the net too wide here? So th this is the dilemma. Uh, either you're probably too narrow or too wide. L let me just highlight this. If you, if you do it, if you overdo it with mechanistic criteria, you will always find arguments where not even combinations of phthalates are regarded as sufficiently similar to warrant joint assessment. And I think then it becomes absurd. There's always slight differences in the molecular mechanisms of how phthalates act in this kind of system. So a grouping like that would be, if it's too narrow, it would lack credibility. On the other hand, um, how wide do we want to cast the net? This is, in my opinion, one of the most difficult questions in mixed toxicology today, to define on a sound scientific basis good grouping criteria for cumulative risk assessment. So this grouping has to be plausible and credible. I'll give you one example. I uh, mention this uh, every now and then. For example, US EPA groups organophosphates, carbamates, thiocarbamates, and dithiocarbamates in separate uh, assessment groups for cumulative risk assessment, when uh, essentially all these chemicals work by the same mechanism, i.e. inhibiting acetylcholine esterase. So, in my opinion, that's an example of a grouping strategy that lacks both credibility and scientific plausibility. So, how can we make headway with these antiandrogens and the phthalates? And here's an insight by someone called Earl Grey, who, whenever asked, says, the developing tissue does not care by which mechanism fetal androgen action is compromised whether by suppression of androgen synthesis or antagonism at the receptor, the outcome is the same. And that opens the door. This is a biological, or we call it physiologically based, grouping criterion instead of getting so hung up about mechanisms. So here's a chart which appears in the uh, NRC report. So here we have phthalates, other antiandrogen compounds, other risk factors through this funnel. Uh, if they all act on androgen action, the outcome is altered male reproductive outcomes, uh, and this has to be taken into consideration. So here's a proposal for grouping. Of course, our favorite chemicals, the phthalates, have to show up. But uh, here's a list of uh, pesticides, that uh, many of which act at the androgen receptor level. We have uh, environmental chemicals that show evidence of antiandrogenicity. PPDDE is, if you like, the classic one. Uh, certain PCBs show these effects, certain uh, dioxins and furans as well. And then there are others, uh, certain parabens, for example, that are in vitro androgen receptor antagonists. UV filter substances and, and some others. So um, I've now I'm moving towards my example of how this could be played out. But before um, I should lay my cards on the table in terms of risk assessment approaches, and this we touched on yesterday. There are two uh, fundamentally different approaches to risk assessment. They've uh, been discussed by Glenn Suter at length. He's written many useful papers about this. There's one, first of all, risk assessment to protect human populations in the sense, you know, we want this deterministic risk assessment. We want to know, does the red light begin to flicker or not? 
And this kind of risk assessment, uh, out of necessity, has to have a bias towards conservatism in case of uncertainty, and that is necessary to protect human populations. The, the aim is mostly to uh, evaluate is there a case for action. This has to be contrasted with, and may not be confused with, a quantitative risk assessment where the aim is really to assess the magnitude of a health impact at current exposure levels. That's some, it's, of course, the two approaches are related somewhat, but it is different. And both approaches use different methods. To contrast this, the quantitative risk assessment approach would very much rely on probabilistic uh, methods and approaches. The question is, in our case, are actually sufficient data at hand to move towards quantitative risk assessment? And to cut a long story short, I don't think there are. So what follows is very much in the camp of this deterministic risk assessment. Um, we started doing this, uh, myself and uh, my collaborator and friend, Michael Faust, just in order to see, let's use the information that's out there and will this kind of cumulative risk assessment lead to the answer, hmm, is there a case to answer or not? With the TDS and the role of chemical exposures. So, the, how can this be done? We are all familiar with the classic uh, single chemical uh, approach. You, make, uh, you divide intake estimates uh, by what you think is a tolerable daily intake, and if this quotient is smaller than one, everyone is happy. Um, there is an approach which is called the hazard index approach to cumulative risk assessment, which builds on this and uh, uses the same uh, quotients, if you like, that's a hazard quotient, but does this for every chemical in the mixture. The demand is then that each, the sum of each of these quotients here uh, should also be smaller than one. That's a, an approach, the hazard index approach, that has been widely used and is still widely used by US EPA, for example, for the assessment of Superfund sites. Normally what they do with Superfund sites, the, the, the demand is that these tolerable daily intakes does not necessarily have to be related to the same endpoint or health outcome. They, they sum up across totally different endpoints. But uh, we thought we can't do this in this case. Let's utilize this approach and sum up over endpoints relevant to antiandrogenicity. So let's not mix up apples with pears, really. Here's the, for the, Chris, I put this in for you. <laughs> right, so in selecting, in making a list of chemicals we want to subject to the hazard index approach, we had to reflect on an effect criterion. And what we chose were c only chemicals with in vivo evidence of antiandrogenicity. We disregarded all in vitro antiandrogens. And exposure information had to be available as well. And let me tell you, these two criteria, which probably seem very straightforward and trivial to you, already proved to be very restrictive. A lot of chemicals had to be thrown out for a stunning lack of information. Um, if possible, our, our goal was to distinguish between median exposures and high exposures. So here's the first list. These are the chemicals which we selected. I, I hope you can see it. It's a little uh, small, but I'll talk you through this. These are the chemicals. We have uh, uh, five phthalates. Uh, we have uh, vinclotilin, procroas, prosimidone, linerone, phenytrothione, here, these are well-documented antiandrogens in vivo, and finally PPDDE down here. The effects um, looked at or taken into account here was suppression of fetal testosterone synthesis, retained nipples for the uh, pesticides mostly, changes in annual genital distance for phenytrothione, 
and retained nipples in male offspring for PPDDE. Now, here is uh, what I would like to define as point of departure, but for anti-androgen endpoints, not for anything. These, these, uh, so this is derived from experimental studies, for example, how to sell. So that either measures a point of departure. It could be either a benchmark dose or a no-observed defect concentration or dose. Here's an uncertainty factor, and here's already the second limitation. Uh, it turns out that many of these studies, in fact, were scientific exploratory studies not designed to estimate very low effects. So, but, but the information was out there. We took account of this by um, combining then, uh, by using an uncertainty factor larger than 100. Normally 100 you use to uh, define a reference dose, but in 100 we've used here for these um, pesticides. So by combining those point of departures from animal experiments with uncertainty factors, we arrived at what we call reference dose for antiandronicity in microgram per kilo and day. And here are the references. Let me say, um, this was important to us as well in order to avoid comparing apples with pears. Let's look at phenytrocyan. Phenytrocyan, if you like, has an official ADI, which in fact is lower than the reference dose for antiandronicity, which we took into account here, because phenytrocyan is also a neurotoxin, and neurotoxicity occurs at doses lower than antiandrogenic effects. So we have not taken the ADI for phenytrocyan in order we feel that would have muddied the waters. Okay, these, um, here's the second uh, selection. It becomes a little hazier here. Um, and here you see already the problem. Uh, here's a flame retardant BDE99. There is one paper that describes suppression of testosterone levels and reductions in anogenital distance in male offspring. Only, only one study. Uh, bisphenol A, there are some studies in Japan uh, that describe decreased testosterone levels in male offspring, but not very well documented. And then propyl and butyl paraben, again here, suppression of testosterone levels, decreased epididymis weights, and decreases in spam production. But in general, these, these chemicals, the evidence for antiandronicity, I would regard as fairly limited. Uh, the data could be better. Nevertheless, uh, just to try out how far we get with this, we included those chemicals as well. Then uh, intake values and yeah, okay. Now here is the first attempt. Uh, to cut a long story short, uh, if we uh, carry out this exercise, cumulative risk assessment using the hazard index approach for median intakes uh, on the basis of 15 chemicals, the answer is there's uh, probably not a case to answer because the hazard index, the sum of hazard quotients here, uh, is 0.38, smaller than 1. Let me just talk you through this table. So here you see those chemicals. Uh, here's the median intake. The next column is the reference dose for antiandrogenicity. The hazard quotient is just intake divided by reference dose here. You make the sum, and here we constructed the ratio of the hazard quotient to the overall hazard index. And because it's 15 chemicals, if they all contributed equally, you would expect this uh, to be around 5%. So highlighted in grey are those that contribute more. So this is a wonderful tool for prioritization. All of a sudden, you see which chemicals are important players and which ones do not contribute a lot to the hazard index. So, for example, um, <clears throat> these here, DBP, uh, DEHP, those pesticides, and butyl paraben, I have to say something about this later, contribute disproportionately to the overall hazard index. But, for example, not PPDDE, not... Uh, Brominated flame retardants, lots of people are hung up about 
brominated flame retardants and antiandrogenicity. Interesting. The human mind uh, without aid cannot easily aggregate prevalence and potency, so you, but this is a wonderful aid to do this and a, a tool for prioritization. Okay, let's look at high exposures. And here the story changes and in the interest of determinist, uh, deterministic risk assessment we have to take this account we're constructing a worst case. Again here, uh, similar construction, high intake, reference doses, hazard quotient, and here the relative contribution. What we see here is that DHP is important, probably DBP as well. Uh, all those pesticides, bisphenol A, butylparaben, propylparaben. However, what worries me is that with bisphenol A, butyl and propylparaben, both the intake estimates and the potency estimates are very shaky. However, the overall sum is 2.01. That's probably over accurate, so let's say two. And you see here butylparaben alone contributes 50%. So we could say, let's take butylparaben out for the sake of the argument because the quality of data is not very good. We would still be left with something quite close to one, which I would conclude to mean maybe we should be a bit careful. We've then carried out well, that's a summary here. For high intakes, we have seven chemicals explain more than 90% of an expected combination effect. There's poor data quality for bisphenol A, the same for paraben. And the surprise to us, if we compare intake values, was that uh, flame retardants and PPDDE contribute very little. This is, uh, goes against the grain of the hobby chemicals of many people in this area. But now we have to have a, an uncertainty analysis. We asked ourselves, and, and you see here, the Empire State Building gets a little hazier. Uh, what are factors that decrease our risk estimates? And definitely, the first one is the question of combinatorial exposures. We have assumed in this worst case that uh, everyone is, or no, that certain people are exposed to the high end. Now, how likely is this really that someone high in phthalates is also high in pesticides? We don't know. For a lack of data, what would, need it, would be needed to address this would be that we have samples from one and the same person analyzed for multiple chemicals. These data are not available. But surely, I think it can be argued that uh, combinatorial exposures would actually decrease our risk estimates. Against this, we have to balance factors that way will definitely increase our risk estimates. And these are, first of all, my worries are that we are dealing with an incomplete set of chemicals. If you remember, um, the selection criteria which we set ourselves meant that very definitely uh, we had to leave out some chemicals where there are su suspicions of antiandrogenicity. So if we had better data and there are data gaps and if we included those as well, the risk estimate would go up again, the hazard index would increase. The Secondly, I have some concerns about underestimations of potency. You remember when I explained how we arrived at those reference doses for antiandrogenicity, many of these studies were really not designed uh, to estimate you no know, observed effect levels or benchmarks. And my concern is that really uh, those uh, risk estimates in future studies, better conducted studies, might actually show that we are, we are lower that would increase our risk estimates as well. So you can see this, uh, by the way, just you probably guessed it, um, with all this we've made the assumption that the exposure of women in the reproductive age is very similar to that of the general population. I think that's a fair assumption. 
really we want to protect the, the male fetus. So here, if you, we go back to the formula for hazard indices, you can see mathematically how this plays out. So we have the exposure levels here. If they go up, then the hazard index will increase. The acceptable levels for single chemicals, if they go down, hazard index will increase. And finally, that worries me a lot, the total number of chemicals that go into this formula here, N. We restricted ourselves to 15. What will happen if we have better data for more potential antiandrogen, uh, which will enable us to put these into this formula as well? Well, for help, we can turn to this man and reflect a little on known unknowns. The in vitro androgen, antagon, androgen receptor antagonists. Um, our lab, we are um, pursuing this with vigor in our lab. Uh, we are testing quite a few chemicals and um, a lot of surprises happen. There is uh, at least 35 pesticides in use, which we know of our androgen receptor antagonists in vitro. There is uh, UV filter substances, they are too and certain dioxins and furans. The question really is, uh, you know as well as I, how expensive it is to do a, an in vitro developmental toxicity study. Do we really want to test all of these in these models? It would be very expensive. On the other hand, there's this information out there uh, about a lot of in vitro androgen receptor antagonists. What do we do? The most uh, serious stumbling block, in my opinion, is this poor and fragmentary information about exposure levels. Uh, for example, about the parabens, there are very crude estimates about exposures done by European scientific committees, but we are not sure. Better data are needed. So, to conclude, I believe that the hazard index uh, approach is a, is a good tool and probably the best we can use at the moment to make headway with uh, at least prior prioritizing chemicals in, in this area and for making headway with getting a feel for whether there actually might be a case to answer or not. Uh, we, it's, a, it's a powerful tool also to identify knowledge gaps and I couldn't anticipate that before we did this and I have to say I was a little surprised about some knowledge gaps. There are loads of pesticides out there where, quite frankly, they are in use and um, there are no in vivo data about antiandrogenicity, nothing. Industry has got away with uh, not providing these data. We can also use this to direct epidemiological research. So epidemiologists might be interested in this and say, right, we can tell them rather than looking at your favorite chemical. For example, there the uh, environmental epidemiology in this area is littered with studies where only the effects of PPDDE on hyperspadias and similar things were studied. This consideration shows us that uh, epidemiology has probably been barking up the wrong tree for a long time and instead should focus on some other chemicals. Uh, it may also be used to focus regulatory action. So, to conclude, I would say we can, we can try out cumulative risk assessment. It is better than anything that happens today simply by pursuing single chemicals. Anything considering mixtures is better than the status quo. And with this, I'd like to thank you. And thank you. thank you. So do we have uh, any questions, comments? I, I have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, in the, the experiments where you are uh, looking at the mixtures, uh, you uh, make a mixture or Earl Grey or somebody 
of, you know, maybe half a dozen chemicals. They're roughly, uh, generally, roughly at equipotent doses. Is that correct? Yeah, these are what we call the, the um, if you like, lab designer mixtures, yeah. where, where the aim is to, um, <clears throat> to refine prediction tools to see whether we can really anticipate the effect of... Oh, of, a absolutely. And, and, and this also is necessary to do so because uh, you have to safeguard against the danger that really you don't do a mixture experiment, although you put some chemicals together, and that's the case when uh, maybe one or only a few players dominate. Oh, that's what's happening. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and also, you're doing experiments as, at doses where you have very measurable effects. And my question is, after, after reading the, that chapter in the NRC report, what happens as you move away from that sort of middle ground when the exposures get lower, where, you know, uh, humans' exposures are not at the 50, thank God, at the 50% effect level, they're somewhere lower, uh, and where the, the mixtures may be a little more skewed. Uh, does, do you think that uh, what's likely to happen, does, will additivity, do you think dose additivity will still apply, uh, or do you think uh, it may be less than dose additive? Um, the, the res I haven't shown this, but uh, we've also uh, nested in some of these studies, we've done uh, what we call our something from nothing experiments, where uh, for example, with the mixture of three androgen receptor antagonists in vivo, uh, it was possible to define a no-observed uh, adverse effect level, and we then deliberately, directly uh, combined the three chemicals at precisely that dose to see is there a mixture effect or not. Yeah. And there was, and it was predictable well by dose addition. Yeah, um, I'm just think with, with all the chemicals we're exposed to in. We know that some of them are anti-androgenic, and uh, probably a lot we don't know. And um, it, if uh, it, it just seems to be it to me, if you keep adding chemicals to your list, uh, it, it's it's going we're going to find that the risk is so high. I mean, it's it, it would be unbelievably uh, uh, implausibly high. And I'm just wondering, as you get to lower and lower uh, uh, exposures to more and more chemicals, does that, uh, you know, do you deviate from uh, additivity? Conceptually, uh, no. Although, if someone gives us the money, we do the experiments. <laughs> but well, yeah, if well, you want, if, if, if you, you want pr to proof positive, but it's going to be damn expensive. Yeah, and yeah, we, yeah. we think uh, uh, we... I personally don't like doing those experiments that are necessary to uh, yeah. prove cons as proof well, you're of talking concept, like but a, uh, you know. I would say uh, if you then go move on into theory, um, yeah. it is to be expected that if you combine many chemicals at low doses, at so if, if they then the toxic units, the uh, hazard quotients end up to a suitably high level, then you will you will get a mixture effect. Of course, if you look at the mathematics of this, you can anticipate situations where, for example, if you have uh, very few relevant players combined with relatively low exposures, nothing is to be expected. But the, that, the answer to that question, and I, I think this is quite important to separate out, is not a, an issue of mixture toxicology. It's, uh, it's one of incomplete information about exposures mm -hmm. and also the mm -hmm. relevant chemicals which we need to take into consideration. Yeah, it, and I agree totally that the, the issue is on exposure because you know, to have all these things at the high levels in any one place in any one time is quite remote. And unfortunately, when people have done risk assessments uh, using um, Monte Carlo techniques, they take the 95th percentile of everything and they throw it in and say, whoop, we got a risk. Sure, of course you do, because you've thrown everything into the hopper and you've only looked at the real high end. And I think we have to be very careful that we have to look at the realistic probabilities of coming up with some situations where, 
there may be one, two, or three chemicals that occur simultaneously because of either high production or they're in products that everyone uses every day and they're, they're high levels in those products. But for the most part, I, I just don't see where that 90th percentile is going to come into play in any reality. We have one thing going for us. Uh, because the phthalates and enhanes, they're, me they're measuring a set of phthalates. Yeah. And so if you could, uh, it, it wouldn't be easy to do, but uh, I think it could be done. If, if you could count, if there were a bioequivalent, uh, a biomonitoring equivalent, whatever you want to call it, if for, you know, each phthalate you have a certain metabolite level, um, and if you could apply some adjustment factor, uh, uh, that would adjust f for not only the pharmacokinetics and then the, also the potency. Uh, you could sample, indiv I mean, we can get the, download the data from NHANES. For individuals? For individuals. If you can download it for individuals and you can have the, the range of levels in the body, you can at least get an idea of how many are present and how many are not. But that means you have to download the whole data set because there are so many of these samples in which there's non-detects and it's... Okay, it's, I didn't think there were that many that were non-detects, It depends upon the individual and it depends upon the compounds because we're talking about a whole variety of yeah, compounds yeah. here. And I tend to get very discouraged when I see people reporting things like the 97th and the 95th and the 50th percentile and they don't... Yeah. They don't report the five and the two and the one percentile, which in fact may, may in fact be, there might be a lot of data. Yeah. But, it, but it, if we knew how to do that, I, I think it's conceptually possible. Sure. It, it would be very valuable, but uh, we thought about this as well, and uh, the problem is one of those metrics. Mm. Yeah. If you have... Um, information about tissue levels in humans, uh, it would be really nice to have the equivalent from animal experiments right. where, where we know that the outcomes are observable. Uh, but unfortunately, there's another data gap we don't. I'm currently involved, I'm currently coordinating an EU project where we're trying to fill this gap, but that's uh, going to be a lot of work. But there's only one uh, hint of what might come. Uh, there's a study by Earl Grey where they looked at, where they gave phthalates to the female rats and uh, measured in the amniotic fluid uh, the phthalate levels and compared to what's measurable in amniotic fluid in humans. And when observed, when they found effects in the rat, the margin of exposure on that dose metric was frighteningly, frighteningly small. Mm -hmm. But that was done only for two single chemicals. Yeah, I've but this is the kind of stuff we would need, and then uh, you know, human tissue levels would come to life, and we could use them. At the moment, uh, I find this difficult because we haven't got the information uh, from the animal experiments to use a um, read across or a parallelogram yeah, approach. Yeah, you mean like even a, a yeah. comparing a, a rat urinary mm. level to a human urinary level? That's not possible at the I don't moment. think that's possible at this time. In fact, I think that would be kind of dangerous in terms of coming up with any kind of uh, reasonable assessments. Oh, no, I wouldn't think it's dangerous. Uh, someone needs to do it and see what, well, what happens. Well, use, using the data, I mean, again, it's the biomarkers in, its, in their own right. They're single points in time. And, and I, I don't think, unless we have time series, that we have any way of of using that effectively for a risk assessment, which, which we're talking about a risk assessment not for just one day in a life, but over a year, or maybe even 70 years. So really, we really have to be really careful how we extrapolate these numbers. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, I, I mean, it's, I look at it, like you said, it's a snapshot, but it's of a, a large population. So is it mm -hmm. any different from looking at one person Yes. From day to day? Absolutely. Absolutely it's different from day to day. I mean, well, for my, an individual goodness, it is, but for the population. Gracious, think, about, think about use of pesticides. I mean, in the United States, if you have people who have, um, you know, farms, gardens, 
uh, people who have pests in the home and they spray their own houses, they, they will have periodic exposures and those exposures will lead to levels in the, in the body that will be decreased over time. And so you sample a person at time X, you find nothing. You sample at time Y, you find levels that are through the roof. It doesn't mean that you will have characterize that individual's exposure and you're using a general population study, sure, it gives you a statistical distribution of the mean, but not the people who are at the high end or the low end. So you really got to be careful how you extrapolate that data. You really do. <clears throat> do you think the goodness of fit that you've seen here is unique to anti-androgenic activity? Or might you find it with other hormonal activities? or even more distantly, non-hormonal mechanisms of action? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. Goodness of fit with the dose response curves, or? And, and also the mixed mechanism, but they still involve androgens. Yes, yes, uh, in, in the one mixture, uh, the three players um, antagonize the androgen receptor and you saw the quality of dose response analysis which we conducted, the uh, regression models with confidence belts, etc. And uh, I'm not sure I'm getting your point, but the diagnostic criteria on which we use to assess uh, agreement with the prediction is an overlap between the um, prediction belt around around the predicted curve and the observed data. If If, uh, if these two overlap, we conclude um, it's in line with dose addition, and that was the case with uh, in almost all the all the uh, examples I've shown you, except this synergism. Any other comments, Holger? I'd like to come back to the biomonitoring data. I think we shouldn't overcomplicate the interpretation of the biomonitoring data and shouldn't oversimplify the interpretation of the external dose estimations, for example, by the chewing experiments and so on, because you can chew and you can't chew. You can take out the dose, you can't. It's the same with the biomonitoring. However, uh, picking up the lead from Paul, I think with the phthalates, we are in a position that we very well know how consistent the exposure is within the general population. You, you have for at least six phthalates always positive biomonitoring values. You have positive detects of at least six phthalates in urine. And to make it clear, detecting has nothing to do with uh, risk or uh, a hazard, but we can extrapolate the metabolite levels pretty reliable, pretty reliable to the dose taken up. And there are other studies, I think uh, Russ will uh, also uh, can, can talk about it, that uh, we pretty much know that uh, those who have been in the upper quartiles are pretty consistently in the upper quartiles for, for most of the phthalates and uh, for others they are not. And yes, we can individually look at the phthalate exposure of each individual. We've done this in Germany with the German Environmental Survey. We can up the phthalate levels on an individual basis. So we can really sum up the dose of each individual regarding the phthalates and looking at the Haynes data plus other anti-androgens. As long as you have time series, you can do that. Yeah, but Paul, isn't it the same with, with the external dose extrapolations, with chewing or not chewing, taking the teeth in the mouth or not? measuring air concentrations and dust concentrations. I, think I can be in the room and I can't be in the room. I can I take think, it up. I think the, the issue of the external dose, the external exposures, um, if you're talking about where the exposure is occurring, if they're occurring in the home, yes, you have consistency because the levels aren't going to change from day to day because you have, you have all these products that have phthalates in them. So that, that's fine under that circumstance. But if you're looking at the high-end exposures, who knows? It can be from anything. But the things where there's a consistent day-to-day -day reasonable 
you know, consistency in levels, which you probably have in most homes. I, I see no problem with it. It's just those high-end peaks, you're going you're gonna to find them that, that that is not easy to predict. No, but we, I think we, we have to have a reality check here. I think we also found that the exposure information for phthalates is, is as good as it gets. It's sufficiently good to do this exercise. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's fine. You, we can, you know, there's good data from uh, the U.S., the NAINS data, and also good data from, from Germany. Very extensive data, and you can construct 95 the 95th percentile as a criterion for high exposure. That's sufficient. We have to be realistic. It's, you can uh, dot the um, I's and cross the T's if you like, but I don't think it'll alter much with a general picture. I mean, there, there have been smaller studies where they looked at people for, what, a week, two weeks or something like. They looked at day to day <laughs> and even within a day. I mean, there are variations. Uh, yeah, I was just going to comment on that, 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 do, that there are those studies where uh, there's repeated measures. Yeah, I guess there's a point where you just have to take a leap. That if, we're, the, if we're limiting our discussion to phthalates, there's no, I don't have a problem with it. When you start burn, throwing in pesticides, you can't. Yeah. It's a totally different set of circumstances and applications and source patterns. Each when one you has, say you can't, what can you not do? You cannot assume that it's going to be a constant level because you have applications periodic and it's not every day of the week and you don't know whether the person is getting a very high exposure on day X versus day Y. It's, it's a difference in terms of source distribution and source release. The emissions from a power plant are consistent from day to day, all right? That's because the source is constant. The emissions of phthalates in the home will be fairly constant because you have similar sources every day. The difference between that and other kinds of sources will, in fact, depending upon the periodicity, the intensity, and the contact that you have, there's, there are a whole different set of, of variables. Yes, but all this is true, but again, we need a reality check. The exposures or intakes of a large number of pesticides are regularly estimated uh, on a mandatory basis in Europe, the, the information is there. Well, I guess it depends. If if you're exposed from residues in food, it may be fairly consistent. That's right. If it's, it's the one you spray at home, yeah. that's a little bit different. Uh, Which is basically where the highest exposure. Ke Ketoconazole, I think, is a, used uh, in for human, you know, athlete's foot or something. So that may be a little more uh, sporadic, uh, but. But I think that yeah. the phthalate exposure is also sporadic because, I mean, apart from home exposure, there's a use of personal care products. You know, you, you use it in the morning, then you may reapply something in the afternoon, the evening. And then I think a lot also depends on the timing of the urine sample. I mean, you, you could have someone that, you know, uses a product at 6 a.m., take a urine sample at 8, and at 10 a.m., you're going to get very different levels because of the short half-life. So I think for phthalates, too, there's a lot of Is it, the intermittent um, exposures. Are the phthalate uh, that are used in personal care products semi-volatile or are they mostly non-volatile? They're the same. That's the butyl and the ethyl. So they're like semi-volatile. But they oh. do, you do absorb them through the skin. So there, there will be, you know, apart from, you know, maybe your home or office environment mm -hmm. where there's an indoor air level, you know, as you apply these products, as you eat different foods throughout the day, mm -hmm. you, you're going to be dosed at different but, levels. But again, for those uh, uh, ethyl and butyl, it, the exposures may be more episodic, whereas for uh, DEHP, DINP, uh, maybe it is more, a little more constant. I mean, it's... I think DEHP, and, and Holger has some data on this that had presented at a meeting a few years ago was primarily through foods, right? So that would also be, you know, episodic. Um, and then a lot depends, too, on the, you know, these spot urine samples, when they're taken relative to oh, yeah, the... Well, that's very important. So, so that's probably why you're seeing, you know, the variability isn't as much as what someone's exposed to as much also as when that urine sample is taken relative to when that exposure occurred. And, you know, you're detecting these in whatever, 90, 95 percent of the population, 
mean, my feeling is, you know, that few percent that you may not be detecting it, it may be that, you know, they're, they're using these products or eating something, but their exposure is far enough remote from the urine sample that you're not detecting it, meaning that there's widespread. So that we need, we're going to need some exposure scenarios or exposure characteristics to deal with what, Andrea? So we're going to be dealing with the 50th percentile, the 90th percentile, we're going to be dealing with a, the, the key will be, you know, how one constructs, it, constructs these profiles to get some level of understanding of how it relates at some point in time to biomonitoring. Because without that, then all this stuff is, could be stochastic exercise. Well, there is, there is some data. I mean, there's, there's data that actually people have taken urine samples multiple times throughout mm -hmm. a day relative right. to a point exposure. Okay. And then there's data on people, you know, repeated measures. You know, you may have 10 or 15 on the same person over a month or several months. So, so those can be used as our benchmarks? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. Well, it is, to answer your question, it is very important uh, if, you, if you pursue the hazard index approach to get the dose metrics right. It won't, uh, tissue levels would, would be of no use for that at this present state because there's only one demand with the hazard index approach. The uh, dose metric of the numerator has to be the same as the one of the denominator, mm -hmm. which is intake. Mm -hmm. The numerator is intake. So, however, if in the future there's more information available about uh, how human tissue levels compare with tissue levels, for example, in the rat that are associated with the effects, then you could do a better read across. But at the moment, this kind of data is not available. But this is not only relevant for interpreting biomonitoring data, what you said. That's relevant for interpreting all data. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to concede that, yeah. Yes, I, I have a quick question, which was kind of in a different direction. I mean, what, what you've presented, I think you've presented it clearly, but it's complex. Um, and so you're looking at compounds that may act through a common adverse outcome mechanisms. But then um, we know that there are chemicals that may alter the metabolism of some of these chemicals. So it could become even more complex. So, for instance, if there's another chemical that may increase or decrease the rate of metabolism and, and therefore clearance of phthalates, is is that something that can be considered in these? I mean, it, it would be, I think, a, another step forward because you know you're you're looking at common adverse outcome or mechanisms. The, but, this is a very important question, and and. The, w this is where the limit of, of this predictive approach to mixture toxicology, where, that's where the limits are of this approach which we pursue. Because what you're talking about uh, is a situation where uh, in isolation, chemical A doesn't do anything, but say combined with an antiandrogen and phthalate would exacerbate the effects of the phthalate or the other antiandrogen. Um, with mixture effect prediction and assessment, this only works for, com for combinations that all produce the effect you're just interested in, and then you can model. So what you've described is a very important point, but uh, at the moment essentially unpredictable, quantitatively. You may arrive at qualitative predictions, you can say, right, if we combine a phthalate with this and that chemical, qualitatively we would expect the effect to get worse or better. But quant you cannot easily predict at this stage to what degree the effect would get worse or better. This is done very frequently with drug interactions. That's you know, right. someone's on drug A and you say, well, don't take drug B because its metabolism is impaired and the dose you're actually taking is not 10 milligrams that your body will see, but, uh, you know, 100 milligrams because drug A is impairing its metabolism, so. So our goal is to 
come up with some numbers that determine whether or not um, there's going to be a ban on the use of these products in in toy, you know, toys, and and other kids products. Um, so how do we approach this going toward what kind of of degree of uncertainty or certainty we're going to allow on both sides of the questions to to at least come up with some reasonable estimates because if we don't set some reasonable targets we can spend our time arguing about you know whether it's you know how much uncertainty we're we're, we're going to allow on any one measurement and I, I'm fearful that that's going to cause us a lot of problems. Well, I think that leads us right into uh, the next thing we wanted to discuss. Um, and I think at this point maybe we should take a break, okay. um, come back at 10:15, uh, and uh, pursue, you know, what is an acceptable risk. The, the point that uh, Byrne brought up and, and acceptable risk with what endpoints. And I think those are critical issues we need to really uh, discuss and, and come to some kind of consensus. I like the idea of reasonableness with respect to doing it, but it's got to figure out what reasonableness it is. We don't have any, everyone here at the moment, but I think we should get started again. Um, and now I'd like to, to start uh, a discussion about some of the uh, issues that we're going to have to come to consensus on. And uh, I think the first one we'll, we'll deal with is, uh, and it's going to be one of our charges, is what is acceptable risk? And in order to really talk about that, we're going to have to talk about with respect to which endpoints. So I'm going to have Byrne lead this discussion. Um, Byrne, would you take take the mic? Yes, I got your cue. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that it will take us a long time to initially reach agreement on <clears throat> what are the endpoints of toxicologic response that we want to consider as the prime <clears throat> endpoints. And we've seen them outlined. We've been talking about them in that context already, but I think we, we need to have a discussion of are we going to cast the net fairly widely and move by brute force through these, or are we going to cast the net fairly narrowly, at least initially, so that we would pick ones that we would most likely be able to reach agreement on for acceptable risk because we have the data to be able to, to consider that. And then if there are endpoints beyond that where it's more difficult, we can always come back and pick those up later. My suggestion <clears throat> would be that we not try the brute force approach and cast the net widely and look at all kinds of endpoints. I would say that we should get our teeth into a, a better defined and a better agreed upon one or two or three and <clears throat> see if we can work out a, a, an understanding of what acceptable risk would be for one or two where we have a lot of information. And it's a re repeatable observations. We're spending our time on what everybody would agree to is th the important endpoint for considering risk. So <clears throat> before we we talk about how we would reach agreement on what that risk or what that acceptable risk is, perhaps we can have a discussion of what are the endpoints that we should really consider. And Mike, you, you had well, if you're talking about um, I don't I don't know if it's on the slide. Uh, I don't think it is. Uh, but if we're talking about the developmental effects in the males, I mean it's it's the range is from, uh, yeah, it's not here, but the range is from, uh, you know, testosterone, starts with testosterone production. Uh, and then from there on up to uh, uh, testosterone production, uh, anogenital distance, uh, nipple retention, 
uh, uh, cryptorchidism and uh, hypospadias, I think, is the range of effects that you see. Uh, you could add in a, a prostate weight or something. There's a couple other things you could include, but those are the highlights. And I guess the question is, do you want to, uh, I don't know that you can have the, the, the whole range of effects on all the relevant phthalates. Um, and I don't know, do you, it, it's a matter of, I think in the NRC report, was it, uh, did you, was it testosterone production or lethality or pup lethality? I can't remember what the endpoint that you focused on. Testosterone. Testosterone, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess that's the other extreme. Uh, but uh, testosterone levels, and that's fine. Usually for that you would pick a, you know, a 10% drop or, you know, you pick some number that you consider to be adverse. Um, I mean, that's a toxicologist kind of uh, decision. But, um, you know, do you want to pick one endpoint? I mean, you can do that. It, uh, apply that to all the, the phthalates. I guess the other option is, depending on the data that are available, um, you might use some combination of the, the endpoints, um, anti-androgenic endpoints. Um, but that's, I think that those are uh, the options on the table for the male developmental effects. You know, which of these endpoints or combination of do you, do you want to use or are they at this point maybe still all on the table? Maybe before we, we try to take the male developmental effects to a final decision, let's look a little more broadly. Yeah. What about the female developmental effects? Um, I, I, I don't know offhand if anybody wants to, to jump, jump in. I mean, the, there are uh, a variety of uh, reproductive and developmental effects. And, for example, if you expose uh, earlier during gestation, there are effects in both males and females, uh, skeletal variations and visceral, uh, uh, the organ uh, malformations and so on. Um, then later in gestation is where you see the um, anti-androgenic effects. And I, I'm not sure at birth you, what you see in the females. I, you know, there's at least one report where there are uh, behavioral effects later on. Uh, um, but that, you know, there, it, it's, it's sort of a, a, a mix of things. But, it, you know, the male pups are the ones that are affected the most. And, you know, that's probably, uh, I think, a a good starting point is to say uh, for any kind of developmental reproductive effects, the um, anti-androgenicity is, is going to be the most potent endpoint for the active phthalates. Um, now, uh, if you want to expand that to all the phthalates, uh, you would have to look at uh, something else like any developmental effect uh, or uh, maybe perhaps the developmental effects that occur earlier in just uh, earlier uh, in gestation. Well, we're fortunate in this, if you want to consider this a, a good fortune, that the most sensitive effect is also a serious effect. Yes. So we're not looking at a trivial effect. Right. Oh, for right. Real, it's, it's, some a real severe, it's a severe effect, yes. Yeah. I don't know the, the literature all that well in terms of um, embryonic exposures uh, to, to phthalates, but I suspect there's not a whole lot there. Do you know, Byrne? I, th I think that's right, and certainly most of the attention has been what Mike has just and talked there, about. There, there's Late, a fair exposures. amount a fair. of studies uh, 
I mean, that was the problem early on. Uh, the studies, uh, I mean, I can't remember exactly uh, the details, but they uh, occurred during organogenesis. And so you didn't see these uh, anti-androgenic effects. You did see malformations, things in the skeletal things, mm -hmm. uh, heart defects, uh, and even uh, kidney uh, defects. And a lot of those are covered in the CE, CERHR reports. The, it was all, uh, I, more recently that people started uh, exposing later in gestation during the, the critical period for sexual uh, differentiation. So I think there's, there's a reasonable amount of data on both. A lot of that is, is um, uh, data and I think much higher doses. Uh, maybe, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, dose response is always. Yeah, I'm not sure how good that is. Um. <clears throat> but even in the older studies, there was usually an effort to try to find a no effect level. Right. Right. And so that's one reference point that we would be working from. I mean, there weren't a lot of a lot of doses, but yeah, I mean, there were generally no wells. Remember. Well, so, so we, we've talked about the male developmental effects and to some extent, a lesser extent, female developmental effects. Those are both categories of responses that we might want to consider for an acceptable risk discussion. Uh, what about exposure to uh, the young animals or adolescents as opposed to adults and the conceptus? Is there a group of effects that are observed primarily when adolescents are exposed, for well, example? Well, not that I know. I think they're just less severe. Uh, you know, similar anti-androgenicity, they're similar kinds of effects. They, uh, uh, just that the uh, juveniles are not as sensitive as the fetus and, of course, the adult, even in the adults at high enough doses, uh, it, It'll damage the testes, um, but they're it's they're just less sensitive. So, if we're going to be looking at products that children are using after they're born, and you know, and while they're growing up, a young age, what what is going to be the endpoint that we're going to target for these estimates of risk? I mean, you know, you say, well, you know, sort of glibly, you know, it goes down. Yeah. But, you know, that's where the target of our investigation is supposed to go, even though we are to include the pregnant mother. I, I don't understand. We, we have to be a little bit more firm than to say, than, well, you know. Well, you so know, you're, you're right. I think you have to consider that they're uh, young children and they're more may be less susceptible than the fetus, but they're more susceptible than adults. How do you make that point um, with some clarity? Can we make that quantitative? Yeah, I, that's, that's a real important That I don't know because uh, the, I think the data are limited. It may be, you know, maybe it's something you apply safety factor to. Uh, I don't know. Andres? There's a recent paper by Richard Chop's group. Um, they looked at the effect of um, suppression of uh, androgen synthesis in the what they call male programming window, um, but also then were able to elucidate that uh, for proper growth and development of external genitalia in these rats, uh, androgen action after birth is necessary as well. So if you Compromise androgen action after birth, it definitely doesn't get better. There's a, there's a nice paper uh, published in uh, International Journal of Andrology, the same volume where our paper. Yeah, yeah I, I noticed there's a, yeah. uh, actually, a, I guess there are they, I don't know if they're reviews, but there's a lot of stuff in that yeah. particular issue. Yeah. So maybe that would help um, us interpret this issue. 
is is my sense correct, Mike, that we're, we're, we're more data rich when we're talking about uh, developmental reproductive endpoints? Definitely. Than, than when we're talking about postnatal. Right. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, this, our strategy might be then to, to use, you know, the more data rich uh, endpoints and then hopefully at some point be able to do some extrapolations to to children and adolescents and adults where the, the sensitivity is, de you know, it's decreased. Well, I, I think th this is the time for us to be complete and not to have to revisit these things later on when we think we're, we've done the job, yeah. only to find out that we have to now go back and look at something else. So if we can eliminate some things now, and Paul, I think your question is a good reminder. Yeah. Because if you look at the next category now in this progression from the developmental effects to the adolescent effects now to the adult effects, I think the question I would have of what we've seen from the adult exposure data would be the question, for example, is there a risk of cancer when neonates are exposed and you get liver, liver cancer as adults? Wow. They're not going to get liver cancer as, as young children or infants, <clears throat> but are there changes in the liver that predispose them to liver cancer later on? Um, yeah, I don't think anyone knows. No. I don't think there's any information on that. Um, but again, it's questionable whether the mode of action is relevant to humans. That's, that's correct. So there are, there's a lot of uncertainty there that keeps this as a low priority concern. Yeah, I think so. But the question that, that I'll come back to is if I'm going to consider exposure as an issue for you know, the, the young child growing up with these toys and personal care products, I'm gonna, we're going to need something to link to. I mean, obviously, you know, what you said, and if we can get some information that helps us with um, um, the male programming, that would be important because I think we that 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 alone is going to have to be the one single thing that's going to make the difference as to how much uncertainty we start with. Because you know, otherwise, um, it's going to be rather difficult to make quantitative assessments. One of the things that Phil and Mike and I were talking about at the break <clears throat> was our need to be very articulate in identifying the assumptions that we make. Right. Because that, I think, will be as important as anything else that we would have in a final document is what assumptions did we make as we tried to determine what the risks were and if we're going to come down with recommendations on restricting uses it certainly has to be a, there has to be a clear identification of the assumptions that we made in arriving at the numbers that we arrive at mm -hmm. to make that conclusion. Are there any other considerations from the adult exposures that direct us toward a potential risk consideration for children? Uh, well, from the, I mean, chronic studies target the, li the liver and kidney, among other things. Right. And it's not just tumors, but other right. uh, chronic toxicity. Um, uh, there, there are also, we should consider, I think, um, reproductive effects in adults. Um, and just as an example, the, the slide that's up here right now, uh, it sums up what the uh, uh, CERHR has said about this set of chemicals, um, or I, I guess all the chemicals that they reviewed. Um, I mean, it covers developmental and reproductive, but there are reproductive effects too in, you know, two gen studies. Uh, it's not all developmental. So, for example, uh, well, let's see if I could find a, a high concern. Um, 
I guess the, the, the most serious ones are developmental. And the reproductive effects seen in adults are through uh, the same mechanism. Uh, 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 for males, yes. Uh, fem females, I'm not so sure. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think some of the questions you're answering, I, th I think Paul Foster would really be, you know, the one that would be able to, to answer some of these. Because um, I know we're thinking, too, about, you know, who to, to bring yeah. here in July. You know, specific questions about how the mechanism may differ in euro versus adult. I, I know some of the data. You know, I'm not as familiar with the laboratory animal data. Um, so I know there are differences. And um, I, I think Paul Foster would really be able to help us through that. Definitely, yeah. He, he'd be the best person to answer a lot of these questions. Okay, that, that's a good thing to put on the side, and we can pick that up when we have the discussion yet today about mm. the questions and the people. Thanks, Russ. Yeah, yeah, he... I think he would have be helpful to uh, confirm our suspicion that the critical effects are, are reproductive and the uh, critical life stage in utero, fetal exposures. Um, he will also, like Russ said, uh, be able to tell us something about uh, other concerns. And I'm wondering, bringing in someone, we need probably someone who will dispel our concerns or the niggling doubts we have about carcinogenicity. We, I think, f all feel that this is of, of limited relevance, but uh, maybe um, we should have this confirmed by an expert. Um, confirmed or otherwise. I'm thinking of uh, who would be suitable, Jeffrey Peters? Uh, he would be fantastic. Uh, if we can coax, coax him down here, um, I think he'd be willing that for a, for a day. I, I missed who you said. Jeffrey yes. Peters uh, is at Penn State. He was on the last chap, yep. and he's he's an expert in the PPAR receptors. Okay, that's another good thing, Phil, to add to that list. Yeah, because um, there, you know, just so many questions that come up. Uh, uh, you, you know, the developmental effects. He, Jeffrey Peters, did have had a paper where, in uh, the PPAR alpha null mice, they looked at de uh, treated them with DEHP, and there were developmental effects uh, even without the PPAR alpha. So. But these were the um, garden variety developmental. They weren't the late gestation, the, the anti-androgenic ones. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we, you always wonder uh, uh, just the, all these questions keep popping up. And, yeah, he's the, he uh, would be able to answer all of those. Is that because they didn't look? Well, at the at time, exposures yeah. late in development. Uh, right at the time, they didn't didn't look at exposures. Mm. Uh, they didn't look, although I mean, they, they didn't do the experiment. But the structure activity relationships are such that they don't correspond to the um, induction of that pathway. So um, these are all. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of nuances. But even if they're, you know, it's not uncommon in these developmental tox studies in the standard design to see decreased fetal body weight. And even if that wasn't mediated by an androgenic mechanism, it's still important. Oh, absolutely. And, and there are plenty of those effects. Yeah. Okay, so we, we've talked about the male and female developmental effects in the adolescents and the adults, and we have questions, but perhaps we have looked at the horizon enough in, in this regard to know that we have an order of priority 
in terms of the nature of the response and therefore the target organ and, and it happens to correlate also with sensitivity. One question <clears throat> to come back to the male developmental effects. Since the, the effects of concern are mediated through this hormonal effect, is it enough for us to look at the hormonal effect, at the hormone changes, and say that everything else biologically is downstream from this, so we don't have to look at each one of these endpoints under the, under the testosterone effect individually, is it sufficient for us just to look at, well, you mentioned a 10% decrease. It could be done that way or there could be other ways to say here's the threshold for an effect on anti-androgenic effects. I, I would welcome your thoughts on that. Because yeah, that, that really gets at the, the accept of how we're going to do acceptable risk. What Correct. what are we going to this, this look at? Testosterone point. production mm -hmm. or yeah. Yeah. AG? Is that, it's a little harder, you know, what, what the problem with testosterone is what's the level that is is adverse? And I don't know. I said 10% as a hypothetical. I have no idea what, what it should be. Um, but that's a judgment. That, that's probably very difficult to judge. But, but what is clear from the data uh, that are published is that for phthalates, the suppression of testosterone, fetal testosterone synthesis is the most sensitive endpoint. So if you base everything on that, you protect yeah. against a lot of the other effects. But again, we can ask uh, Paul Foster for confirmation there. But I think as far as I uh, know the literature and judge it, that's the case <coughs> with phthalates. For all other chemicals, the most sensitive one is nipple retention. And with phthalates, you're getting pretty close there too. So if you regard nipple retention in the rat model is, is indicative of disturbance of androgen action in fetal life. Now there's an argument uh, among some toxicologists who helpfully point out that um, this effect is not uh, of relevance to the human, but um, that's an argument to be had. I mean, that's, um, that's the question, yeah. Just where do you, you draw the line? Yeah, if you accept that we can't, uh, I mean, rats are different from humans, thankfully, in many ways, so we are different from them. If you now take the stance that we are dealing with a model anyway, and this is a model for disturbance of androgen action in fetal life, I think one can get around this problem. In the rat, that is indicative of disturbance. Uh, let's, let's use that and... Uh, extrapolate to the human, although uh, this plays out in a different way in the human. Females have uh, yeah, I mean, two it, it would help me uh, to see the, the dose responses together, like this level of testosterone <coughs> reduction causes this level of nipple retention and so on. Um, I, that might help me sort it out. but. Right. So, so, <clears throat> so, but we, uh, just to conclude, I think we're, you're also driving at this other issue. Uh, there is, uh, you have uh, with phthalates a certain effect spectrum typical of of disruption of androgen action, and that differs in some respects to with the effect spectrum which we, you get from androgen receptor antagonists. They are distinct in certain. For example, uh, flutamide or, and, or vinclozolin will not lead to reductions in testosterone synthesis. But there's a, there's a commonality, there's an overlap of the effect seen with phthalates in the rat and those seen with androgen receptor antagonists. So one could say we could go for the most sensitive common effect of all these chemicals, which I, I guess would be nipple retention. The alternative would be to say we've played this through in the uh, paper which I showed you this morning, uh, we've said, right, we go for for the most sensitive endpoint regardless. We weren't looking for common effects or an overlap. But that's open for debate, really. My feeling is that this is a, considering all the other uncertainties we have to deal with, that's uh, the least of my worries. I think if we go there and uh, really begin to wax lyrical about this, we are going to gild lilies, dot I's, and cross T's, rather than address the real, the real problems. <laughs>
I don't know whether that was that's helpful. that's helpful. And Mike, I think what you said is is helpful as well. In that we need to know the dose response here. We need to know whether the anti-androgenic effect, the dose response for that, predicts these other downstream markers. And if they don't, then we have to look at those. We have to look at hypospadias. We have to look at nipple retention. We have to look at others separately, in addition to the effect on to the anti-androgenic effect. If in fact you can't look at a dose response curve for the anti-androgenic response in the animal and predict that yes, this is where we would see nipple retention. This is where we would see hypospadias. I, I mean, I think that's true that it, they follow, but. Um, we need to we have that ask, in hand. And actually, Earl Gray might be the best person to ask about that. <clears throat> and we may want to get into this discussion a little bit more when we talk about acceptable risk. Yeah. Because that's where it becomes extremely critical. At this point, we're just trying to identify what are the endpoints that we're going to focus on. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we've, maybe, for now, maybe we've had enough of that discussion and we could proceed to thinking about, you know, we, we have a list now of endpoints and responses that we would wish to use as the model. And if we use these, somebody else isn't going to come along and say, well, they, they failed to include a very important toxicologic response, well, this one. The, the, I mean, the problem is, yeah, I mean, the problem is it's in the eye of the beholder. And you will, f you know, if you look through the, scour the literature, you'll find uh, an occasional tumor site uh, parathyroid or, um, you know, the couple of studies about um, uh, trying to link phthalate exposure to asthma, but it's only, I mean, it's not, it's a, it's not a strong link. They're not strong links and they're sporadic. I mean, you see it uh, with one or two phthalates. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to be the devil's advocate in, yeah. you know, there's something for everybody in there, but I, uh, they're just not consistent. And I don't, I don't see uh, how, uh, you know, that would uh, be important to include in, in something where you're looking at total phthalates. And I, th I think, you know, to cover ourselves if, if we need to do that, um, in, in the introduction or, or someplace, you list all of the known adverse outcomes, and then proceed to say for you know, the effects of phthalates on parathyroid tumors, there's you know, not enough information for us to really go through an acceptable risk analysis for, for that endpoint, and do it that way. Then we've, we've covered our bases and, and given and made it transparent what it, why, what it is we're covering and why. I think we can do that. I think it might also be reasonable for us to now summarize in writing this list of endpoints that we think are most important for determining acceptable risk. And we can ask that of the Jeffrey Peters and Paul, Paul Foster and others who we might come in and ask if they disagree with that. I think that's a fair evaluation, a fair opinion to, to seek from them, and if they say, oh, you, you really missed this one, well, then we need to consider that. Can I suggest to maybe also include uh, Gray in that, because uh, he's equally expert with these yes. things as Paul. I, I would plus, uh, I would include him, sure. Plus has knowledge of mixture effects. As maybe we should invite the whole combo. It's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. There's always a risk that we won't invite somebody who will be insulted because they weren't invited, but nonetheless, there's, you as a group have a good feel for who are the greatest contributors. I mean, if, if I had to pick, you know, three people to invite in, it would be those three, so. Yeah. Holger. However, still taking into the consideration the task of this committee here and screening the last, let's say, two years of literature regard, in regard of epidemiological evidence. I see publications on delayed exposure with less male typical behavior in young boys, attention deficit or hyperactivity disorders 
obesity, insulin resistance, and so on. I'm not saying anything about the quality and reliability of the papers and the data, but still I would like to have it checked and at least discussed. Absolutely. I think it would be a shortcoming not to yeah. look into it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was trying to get at in terms of, I think somewhere we have to have a list, a table. Yes. Here are all the adverse effects that have been reported. And we're not making a judgment about quality of data or um, conclusions. Um, but you're right, I think that's absolutely necessary. But also from the standpoint that <clears throat> we have, we don't want to be criticized by the epidemiology community for looking only at mouse data or rat data. So I think in, in order for us to not be criticized in terms of whom we bring in in July to advise us on their thoughts about this, we should include an epidemiologist or two if, if there are such people who can advise us broadly on what the epidemiology literature say beyond, I mean, in addition to what we can get. Uh, Russ? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I can do that. I mean, I'm familiar with those studies. I'm actually giving a talk next week and that includes, it's the Stephanie Engel study and on um, the aggressive behavior and then Shauna Swan's paper on the play behavior. And there's, there's probably four or five. So I am very familiar with them. I could, you know, put something together for July, but we can also consider potentially bringing in some of the authors if, if we want, but it's an individual for each of those four or five papers. Yeah, I mean, that's, well, I, that was a big consideration um, in, in assembling the CHAP, and, you know, we wanted to cover the reproductive or developmental toxicity and make sure we covered epidemiology, and if we could have had more uh, people, we would have had more epidemiologists, but, uh, um, that's definitely uh, uh, something we can't overlook. Then I, I think we should make a decision here. Do we want to invite an epidemiologist or do we want to rely on, on Russ <clears throat> giving a summary of? I know that we will get good information and help from Russ. But what I'm addressing is what the image, image. is. Uh, I was going to say that we, the two, two, yeah. two issues, you know, in terms of yeah. the interpretation, yeah. which I feel comfortable doing, but also in terms of the, the balance in the image right. yep. of, of also hearing from epidemiologists. We could in, invite Shauna Swan, or is there someone else you might suggest? There's uh, Stephanie Engel from Mount Sinai. That the, okay. uh, it's probably the paper you're referring to, Holger. Yeah. Um, she works with Mary Wolf, who's also on the NRC report, but I think Stephanie um, would, be, would be good. Um, was there other papers, Holger, that you, you saw? It was, it's, it's at least reference to one, two, three, four, six or seven papers <sighs> right now, which came up in the last couple of months. So. I wouldn't restrict it to Stephanie Engel. I'm not sure. Maybe we should discuss it in more detail later on. Right. Well, she would, she would really just be familiar with that single paper. Yeah. With the yeah. Main, yeah. Yeah. And I have concerns too with the way they group the phthalates by molecular weight, and you know, but that's beyond today's discussion. So, well, anyone who would, would have more of an overview uh, of the epi field with respect to what we're interested in, I'd ask. You know, an Earl Grey-like. Yeah, I mean, Anna Swan would have, probably have more of an overview. Okay. That would be similar to my overview, but uh, I think for balancing the presentations. And, and you know, the other, uh, I'm just trying to think of <clears throat> if we invite these people in and invite testimony from the public there's going to be. So we may need a, you know, well, if it ends up being a day and a half of testimony, then that's, that's okay. I think, and I think, Bernie, you were going there too, that we should formulate questions for the people coming in so they have time to prepare. Yeah. Right. You know, like a question like, you know, what, what, percent change in testosterone 
would be associated with uh, X-fold increased risk of hypospadias in, in that study or hyporchidism, right? And, and I would Just as, hope, an, as an example. Yes. Yeah. And I would hope also that by giving them a, le a lead time, that they would come prepared to express, uh, to express the opinions of their colleagues as well, and that we don't hear just somebody reiterating what they've already said in their publications. Right. Uh, yeah, they're not, you have to be tactful to get that across well yeah. <laughs> without insulting them, but. They're not just presenting their, their research. I mean, right. we have a specific question yeah. or question, set of questions. And we want their opinion, but we also want what their colleagues would say, because they're representing their colleagues as well. Want the state of the art is what we mm -hmm. want them to mm -hmm. give us. Yeah. Yep. So Phil, maybe that maybe we've taken this as far as we need to at this moment, if you're ready to step off into the other discussion. Well, I'm, I'm wondering in terms of now questions for these individuals, should we leave it at um, all of us will, will submit uh, Questions after we review whatever literature we wish to, to to Mike, who will then convey them to these individuals that we're inviting. Is that the strategy? I think, for doing I think we would benefit from some more discussion today, because hearing the opinions of others is very helpful, at least to me. Uh, you mean in terms of formulating the questions? Um, well, not wordsmithing, but at least you know what kinds of questions do we want yeah. to have them be prepared for. And then we can wordsmith it, and I'll help you with that, Phil. Yeah, we we'll also just add to it, too, because so you want to proceed developing questions, yes. ideas for questions for these individuals that we're going to invite. I, I think today we need to have a discussion of what kinds of information do we want to have brought to us, and then who can bring that kind of information, and then a third approach would be what are the questions that we specifically want to in, to ask of Paul Foster's and Jeffrey and Earl others yeah, and also um, as we uh, um, in terms of the public testimony I mean we're inviting testimony from the public we could spell out the questions we have uh, it, you know like about product uses or unpublished data, whatever it is, you know, we could uh, pose a list of questions and say, this is what we want to hear. We might not get it, but that's usually what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's proceed. So how do you want to, which do you want to go back to the discussion of uh, what do we mean by acceptable risk and, and develop questions in that arena? Wherever you want to go next. Um, yeah, that probably would be beneficial to do that first because that, that may then generate questions that we want to uh, provide to these individuals who are going to come and also to the, the public. To do which? To, to, to go to the uh, discussion of what do we mean by acceptable risk. You want me to follow that or are you going to? No, go ahead. Okay. Or who, whoever wants to jump in on that. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think it would be real easy for us to reinvent the wheel here. And for some of, for some of you who have been involved in these discussions before at the NRC or other places where you have, have already had this discussion, will, will you please start this discussion for us and then we can modulate it as we go and add to add to it as we go but for those of you who have already done this would you please start us silence is deafening <laughs> put you on the spot i think if i remember right if from our our discussions we started off i think talking about the multiple Potential endpoints. I mean, I think we did have a little bit of discussion on on cancer, hepatic, et cetera. And I know Paul and Kevin contributed a lot there. And so I think we started off very broad, but then we, I think, relatively quickly narrowed down to 
the anti-androgenic testosterone effects. So, and, and if I remember right, I don't think we spent you know a lot of time on the other endpoints, and I think part of it was you know maybe the data, but also the sensitivity of the response to low dose. So, so, in, so my question would be, if you already narrowed it down when you went to the NRC, what is it that we're going to get that's new from these three highly qualified people? The question I have is, where, what kind of questions are we going to ask them? We're going to repeat to say the question of what are the most important effects of concern or what are the new data that can help us reduce the uncertainty about this, this particular suite of effects and have we learned something that puts something else on the table? Yeah, that would be, be this, my question. This, the second part of your statement, that, that it would be really trying to, you know, new data, it hasn't been that long, but there probably is some, and then I think there, there are thoughts about some of the questions related really to developmental reproductive effects rather than, you know, I, I think we can relatively quickly narrow it down, but then I also think bringing in Peter Jeffries in, in terms of making sure that, you know, the hepatic and the liver cancer is, is something that we should not pursue. Um, before we confirm that decision, could, could I add to that? I think I think the the aim to invite those is is not really to uh, generate new information. We can do we can read we can mm -hmm. all of us read, but I think it is to uh, remove doubts that might linger uh, about uh, a special take which we have already of the situation. We all think that developmentally reproductive effects um, are the critical one and we think that cancer is probably not not so urgent but uh, that's my interpretation of the literature and uh, others probably do the same but I would like to have this view confirmed by the experts. So only that. It's it's rather than uh, mm -hmm. emphasis on new data, mm -hmm. uh, we can all read them. It's it's sort of uh, matters relating to judging uncertainties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you're focusing on reproductive, my question would be to them: is is there enough information to link, or at least suggest the linkage between the reproductive effects and the, the, the effects that occur in a young child after birth. But that's very difficult. That that question uh, they will not be able to answer. No one, no one can with certainty at the moment. But can at least shed because that's going to be a critical question that we're going to have to <clears throat> grapple with. And <clears throat> I would love to hear a discussion. To me, because it's going to be the toughest question we have a critical discussion as to whether or not that those links can be made, what degree of uncertainty, and, you know, what pitfalls will there be in trying to make those links? Because, you know, I think if you're going to have three highly qualified people coming in, they're going to have, if they're going to help us with this task, to me those are the, que those are the kinds of questions I'd like to see answered. If to whatever degree possible, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I, I think they, they're good questions that we should strive for answers to, but I don't think, I understand. yeah, yeah. But I, I, I think within their respective fields, they can give us perspectives so of mm -hmm. the animal and the human data and then, you know, discussing links. But I also think, you know, and as you were saying, you know, the, the new data we could read, but there's also, there was talk about NIEHS putting thirty million dollars towards new phthalate research. So it'd be interesting to know what where they're going with that. I mean, is um, so so potentially you know the new data if it's published we can read it. But there are kind of new directions or thoughts that um, you know Earl and Paul can provide in terms of you know what yeah, next, what definitely. are the next steps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The data may not be ready for for our conclusions, but I think it will help inform us. You know if, if they let us know where they're going. It lets us know, you know, what, where some of the gaps are. Because this acceptable risk question is something that 
you know, I've been involved in those discussions many times, but I must admit I don't listen real hard because it isn't something that I've had to do from day to day. Help, so help me understand if, if we say that we've arrived at a decision that a risk is acceptable or not acceptable for a chemical for certain age children, for certain endpoints, is this a bright line kind of a, a decision? Or is it like we make for drugs and foods and other things where there's a margin of safety that you consider? Or is it based, uh, wh what, what numbers do you feed into that last vote when you make a decision of yes, it's acceptable or not? Can I? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I uh, well, I'm, I'm aware of those discussions in, in the cancer arena where what is, what is an acceptable risk, one in, one in yes. a million or something like that. Uh, that question doesn't shape up like in this way in this particular arena. Um, the discussion there is rather what, what is an acceptable or unacceptable exposure. And that's, that's resolved by making those comparisons between um, points of departure, say, from relevant animal models and human exposures and then judging margins of safety or et cetera, et cetera. But it's, as far as I'm aware, not answerable uh, in the sense uh, that's done in the cancer arena, one in one million, et cetera. So we would have to rely on dose or intake comparisons. Okay, for, for these end points that we've talked about, the developmental endpoints, <clears throat> we would know no effect levels, or we would, we, that's one thing that we would nail down from the animal studies. So then to create a ratio and a number, what, what is the exposure data that we need to have because eventually our recommendation is going to be that the, the level at which these phthalates are found in products that children are exposed to is either acceptable, it's either above or, or not above a, a threshold that we decide. Yeah. So we're going to recommend either to lower it or leave it alone. How, then what do numbers do you put <laughs> in that ratio do. for us to say, okay, it's okay or it's not okay? If the no effect level in, in an animal model okay. is one of those two numbers, what's the other one? The, the other one, but one would be intake, human intake. Kids, adults, pregnant women, whatever. Well, it would be, the, would it be the, the, if you know what the no effect level is and you have an idea what the intake is from the products we're concerned with, Remember, not totally. Do are they within reach of one another? Are they three orders of magnitude difference? That will allow us to determine whether or not there's some margin of safety we may have to apply to some number to say that this is acceptable. And does the way in which we use this product today provide enough margin of safety for that intake to? ensure that we're well below a no effect level. I mean, right. that's the logic I would use. Okay. Uh, but can I just, uh, sorry, Paul, remind all of us that we also, according to the charge, have to consider intake from all other sources, so not only from, from those toys. Well, I'm talking about in terms of banning a particular toy, we have to look at it relative to everything else, and if it's minuscule, compared to everything else, which is what the only thing you can do, then you may or may not want to change the number right now or desire banning it. Yeah, I mean, the question is, when we talk about the everything else, how detailed does, does it have to be? Is biomonitoring good enough? Because that gives total exposure. And like Paul said, you estimate exposure from the children's products, uh, compare that to the total exposure or combine it in a cumulative risk assessment and so on. Um, I don't know that we necessarily have to uh, articulate all the, what all the other exposures are, like so much from food, so much from cosmetics. I mean, but we can, nice. but we, it would be nice. We don't necessarily have to do that, I think. 
Well, I well think it, it says very clearly in the charge that we do. Yeah. yeah. Well, we said so we have to con consider all sources of exposure. Yeah. That's right. I think Andreas is right. We have to do that. We have to. We have to qualify Point six. to the to the. To, to the best, again, going to number six, we have to quantify it to the best of our ability so that when we make this determination that either these products are or not a significant proportion of the intake that, you know, we have to consider, that has to be a reality that we have to address and, and make decisions upon. We just can't leave that, well, you know, we know that there's a high intake from food. Well, we have to really be able to provide some degree of number generation plus uncertainty around those numbers and can do a comparative analysis of comparative risk with respect to what we suspect would be the intake from a toy or personal products that include this material in a child's world. There are several more specific things that I think we need to talk about one at a time. And Paul, one, one of the things that you raised was the proximity of the no effect levels to the exposure. Mm -hmm. Usually we look at that from the standpoint of a margin of safety that's acceptable. Yes. So is a thousand fold difference from the Noel the, the threshold of concern or is it 500 fold or tenfold or Unity. And what to, there, there are so many different experiences out there that people have had with these things that you can have a whole range of numbers, and you have. To, I think we have to make our best judgment based upon a number of factors, including the the source, the frequency of use, the likelihood that the the, no, the levels may increase or decrease, the the number of other alternative, you know ways of getting, it's really expert judgment at that point. And we're going to have to wait a while to come to that, but it's good putting it on the table. But the, the thing that I'm concerned about, though, is we're not in this discussion, we're not pointing out the fact that for one chemical, it depends on what the other chemicals are. It's not just the no effect level for a single chemical. I thought I mean, we you were, have to have that in context to other things. I thought we were t talking about all the phthalates we are going to be considering as a group not just one phthalate. I wasn't thinking of one phthalate. I think your point is that whether, is this discussion related to one phthalate at a time? No. Or is it the composite? The it's the integral, I thought. But except the way to get to that is to. Do them one at a time. Get the, do them one at a time. <laughs> but I um, think. And, and combine them using, you know, our, that's one way to do it. Or uh, did you mean that uh, when you discuss margins of exposure, which normally don't take combined exposures into account, do you mean that we have to increase the margin or make allowance for that? Possibly we do. Or, or maybe even play a game of, you know, uh, well, what if these chemicals are at this level? Then what is that margin? Or what, you know, some kind of a sensitivity. Yeah, it's, there, there will be a sensitivity analysis, and I think that is a progression as we move forward. But I think your point is right. We can't lose sight of the fact that this is a suite of phthalates and not one. And, right. and what I felt comfortable with Andreas's, you know, presentation this morning is that we're not dealing with a complex degree of synergism. It looks like linear additiv additivity has some degree of confidence in terms of demonstrating effects in the animal, so I don't feel uncomfortable right now. I guess kind of what I'm looking for is whether there are precedents that have been set that say that a, a tenfold margin of exposure is the standard, or 100-fold. Well, uh, for most people, for if it's based on animal data, would say 100-fold. Right. Yeah. If it's human uh, data, it's If 10. it's human data, it's 10. If it's children, you know, if you're worried about 20. Sensitive population, some people might 20. want, like, a little more, yeah, uh, 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 up it a little bit, but. Yeah, 100, 10, and 20 are the ones that I hear floated around I mean, they're the d sort of defaults. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could use what, uh, you can set them at whatever you want, mm -hmm. but those are the defaults. I guess what I'm trying to anticipate, Mike, is whether we're going to go 99% of the way to making a decision 
and the last percent, we're going to be arguing no, a margin of 10 isn't enough, it should be 15. Yeah. Or it should mm. be 30. We might end up doing that. <laughs> but, then, but then it becomes a unique judgment tool of this committee as opposed to a state-of-the-art kind of approach. Well, not, not, no pressure, but one of, the, one of the points, one of the Roman numerals is to use all appropriate safety factors. So, you know, to make sure you, I guess that means to make sure we're protecting sensitive populations. Um, and that's one approach if you, for example, if you don't have data for uh, juvenile males, you take the adult data and add another safety factor. I mean, that's one way to do that. Yes. Well, or three or more two specific. or whatever. But if you have a specific you talk to. mechanism to say that uh, a factor of 1.3 is scientifically justified, yeah. you can do that. Yeah. But it doesn't happen yeah. very often. But the only thing I would add to that is to use these these considerations, the appropriate approaches, appropriately. Yeah. <laughs> and to not just use them because they're there. Yeah. And we keep adding on factors. Yeah. Agree. Totally agree. Be comfortable in this committee with making those decisions? Or do we need other outside input? Well, with them working th there's a huge list of people who would like to add their names to those who get to vote on this. Mm -hmm. And we can't bring them all in. No. And we can't entertain all of their biases in how to do this. So I, th I think it comes down to the comfort that CPSC have, has in having selected this particular team. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, put it this way, I'm comfortable with whatever the panel decides. <laughs> uh. Okay, so that that helps me, having had this discussion, to know that we're we're in a range of a margin of safety, that you know, ten to one hundred, and maybe us more than one hundred if it is need be, and we can tailor that to the situation and, as we get there. In the other question, uh, now that we've discovered distri frequency distributions and don't just look at point estimates now, I mean, does the, are, no one can answer this. Do you apply it to the average exposure? Do you apply it to the upper bound, you know, 95th percentile? Um, uh, you know, I think it's, the answer might be to the median exposure, but. Sometimes they use upper bound. Yeah. Yeah. The 95th, 95th percentile. I mean, that's where I think we should get some guidance from but I, well, the approaches let, that have been used. Well, let me put it this way, uh, uh, you know, because, I mean, you brought this up uh, in the data. You have a 95th percentile exposure. Is that person at the 95th percentile every day, or we just hit them on a bad day, you know? Well, that's the point. I mean, if, if we're going to have somebody do some calculations of risk, we have to make sure that I mean, exposure profiles, we're going to have to make sure we understand. We, we define the scenario for them and define it in such a way that we can come up with a reasonable number. Yeah. I think that's an important point. Chronic exposure, point exposures, and I think in this context we might also have to discuss the concept of the TDI, chronic exposure, if it is relevant for the phthalates. Mm -hmm. or if there is a single exposure enough at a certain point in time during sexual differentiation. So I think we might discuss this, whether a single exposure might be enough to yeah. set the damage. And I think after the slides uh, Andreas has shown, I think uh, at least what the red data shows, there are certain windows of susceptibility that we might have to take account of. But I think uh, Earl or Paul might say something to this. Also a discussion area under the curve or yeah. concentration. And, and just adding is kind of pharmacokinetic differences between rats and humans because I know in those studies with the critical window it's, it's a single dose but is the half-life similar or, or not and then how is it metabolized, et cetera. Any responses to that comment? Mm 
I, I, I'd like. Yeah. I don't know. I suspect that in humans, the window is broader. No. It's probably broader. The critical in, window for exposure to the fetus. Yeah. Well, it's probably. I guess it depends what you mean by broader. I mean, it probably ranges in rats. It's maybe a few days. I'm not that familiar. Two days in humans, it could be first trimester. Right, longer in weeks, but potentially a single point within that window may be just as relevant yeah. mm -hmm. in a eight week window as in a two day window. So that's a good point. Okay. A couple of other points that I would like to have a little more discussion on. And so we've talked now about the, the animal data and no effect levels. You, you raised the point, Andreas, I think, earlier about uncertainty. And what there, this could include the quality and quantity of data available. And I think we have talked about endpoints where we're not looking at a single study and somebody's interpretation of a single study and the possibility that it's not even repeatable. We're looking at, I think, pretty solid endpoints here. So I don't think there's an uns a large uncertainty. There may be uncertainty about whether nipple retention has a, a, an application to another species. But from the mechanistic standpoint, if, there, if it's an anti-androgenic effect, it's an anti-androgenic effect that should predict other anti-androgenic effects in another species where that hormonal activity is developmentally important. So I'm not too worried about being able to defend that if we get into that corner. But from the exposure standpoint, what is the quality of data, and I'm not being critical, I'm, I'm expressing my lack of knowledge, the quality and the quantity of data for us to be able to know the exposure sufficient enough to match the quality of data for the biological response. Yeah, it's going to be hard. We're, we're going to have a lot of uncertainties. We're, we're, we're going to, and we're going to have, I think, you and I are going to have to sit down and think about what are the scenarios that are the most realistic and consider what, what kind of distribution functions one can ascribe to them. I mean, it is, it is going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. And for little kids, it's going to even be tougher because the data is sparse on activities for kids. We mean, you have this, you have your simulations, you have the, the adult surveys. I hate to say this, but, you know, memory of parents on what kids do is, is rather poor. very poor. We, we've done studies where we've had the parents fill out questionnaires and we've done videotaping. Sometimes we wonder where the parents were during the entire day because <laughs> they don't match up at all. And it's, it makes things a little bit cumbersome um, when you're trying to deal with it. But those problems aside, we still can, we can still come up with some reasonably logical scenarios. And it's a matter of, in the end, where you all think and that's when it always comes back to the toxicology. Is it the cumulative dose of all these low level exposures? Is it the periodic frequency of the periodicity of frequent, infrequent, or frequent high doses? These are all considerations that we have to, ha have, to have to be able to come up with a meaningful exposure. And th th those are questions that. I think we need to have answered because exposure is just not a number. It's a number with a biological response and a biological halftime associated with somewhere. Well, I think we're going to have to have a fairly important section of a report on exposure, <clears throat> taking into consideration not just generalities, yeah. but there are some very specific things about this. We're talking about sensitive periods of pregnancy. And we're talking about chemicals that have that are rapidly absorbed and rapidly eliminated, mm -hmm. but they're stored in fat. That that those two things drive some critical considerations for risk. Mm 
and one that was made before is very important and it often isn't taken into given isn't given much consideration and that is that a single exposure at the critical time can be more important than a prolonged exposure that gives you the same area under the curve but may never reach a critical concentration to cause the effect absolutely so that that is the kind of thing that we need to put in there as statements of our understanding of how to reach a judgment about risk assessment. And that's f for one endpoint, it, it may be, well be the peak exposures, but for another endpoint, that, it that's correct. would be the average ones. Mm -hmm. And also I think we need to be able to address the question, of are, are there any phthalates in this composite mixture that by themselves are of considerable concern for risk? And whether there are or not, how much greater is the risk when you consider the cumulative? The, the do they have co-exposures or are they different? Do, do we deal with them as a total exposure or are we dealing with them because they are unique in terms of the source that they can go on and be on their own as a separate entity in this risk assessment? But, but there, if there are there are critical questions. If, if we come to a conclusion that the, the composite exposure to phthalates is what is important, that doesn't help the manufacturers no. because their product doesn't have, their product doesn't have that. They right. have one or two phthalates and they will back away from us and say, well, you're talking about a situation that isn't ours, fortunately. Mm -hmm. As a result, we don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. When in fact, that's why we need to be able to address the individual phthalates and say yes or no on them as well as the composite. That's a good point not to lose because, again, it goes back to, you know, we're looking at products. Products will have specific phthalates. We're not looking at one product that has every phthalate. And, you know, the differentiation of cumulative exposure versus product and single phthalate exposures complicates the, the equation rather dramatically. But it is the real world. Yeah, well, that's so, absolutely. So we have that's to focus <laughs> on that as well. So for us to ignore that would be a terrible mistake. It would be a disaster. Mike, a question of how we capture ideas. I mean, there are a lot of things that we'll talk about there occasionally is something that we would like to have put in the parking lot and save it mm -hmm. to be able to identify the list of things that we put in the parking lot whenever we want to, to make sure that we don't forget them and that we have them in a, how can we do that? Um, I mean, I'm trying to take good notes and um, what the best thing to do might be for us to compare notes uh, by email after the meeting of what of it. action items or as things as you said parking lot items um, uh, I'll go through my notes and try to pick those things out okay Andreas you had a comment yes I'm, I'm trying to go back to your issue with uh, uncertainty which I think is a very important one um, the way, the way I see this going is as follows, roughly. Um, I think we have to go through a process of quantification, maybe quantifying the unquantifiable by starting with individual phthalates and then putting it together. Maybe the uh, hazard index approach provides a suitable framework. If we accept that, that's what we would have to do. But then if we we must be careful in my opinion not to get too hung up about numbers and taking them sort of as absolutes in view of all this uncertainty we uh, that's i think the main issue one of the main issues we have to face or deal with at some point what are we going to do we, when we know there is exposure to chemicals that have that are potential in vivo antiandrogens when we know already they are active in in vitro assays we can never be sure absolutely until they're tested, but within the lifetime of our deliberations and this committee, uh, I don't see that this situation changes at all. So we can, uh, before we 
uh, gild the lilies with quantifying this for phthalates, I think we have to be aware of these major sources of uncertainty and um, take this into account by choosing better margins of exposure, etc. Or maybe we should uh, funnel this into a qualitative question and at the end taking into account all available evidence and on balance, are we of the opinion that exposure to salage uh, should go down or not? And if the answer to that question is yes, then we then consider the charge in relation to proposed bans or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we should get too hung up about numbers, I, and I don't think that the outcome of our deliberations will be will be a risk number or something like this. You see what I mean? You're, you're saying that we should do weight of evidence in terms of how we're going to make our judgments I, rather than specific. I think that the data situation will force us into something like that. We'll see. <laughs> it, it may be the right way to go, but I, I think we're going to have to come up with a number. And when we, <clears throat> part, part of the consideration, I don't know where you put this in a report, is that uh, as we talk about possibly the need to restrict the inclusion of a phthalate in a product, we need to be cognizant of the fact that that will drive a replacement yeah. of often unknown. Uh, we'll know less about the replacement chemical than we will about what's being taken out. Yeah. That's a risk consideration as well. We, we need and it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we should do nothing. It just means that we need to be aware that that will be a consequence of our decision. Absolutely. And have that in there someplace. Mm -hmm. I, Russ. I just wanted to, when you said that, uh, to put something in the parking lot, and that's uh, about the alternatives. Because some of the, ex or all the experts we're th thinking of bringing, at least for the July meeting, is, are those that are familiar with phthalates but in terms of the alternatives, right? Because that's something we're going to have to yes. look into. So I don't know if now is the time to, to discuss it, but just to put it um, a bookmark there so we, we know to come back to that. From my experience in the chemical industry, <clears throat> people, for anyone, for people from the major companies know what's going on in all the companies and could express thinking about what, how do we select alternatives? And based on what criteria, and based on what kind of a database would a criteria would a an alternative be accepted, be considered? And if perhaps we would want to ask somebody to address how how, how are alternatives selected? Um, one possibility would be to to ask to solicit testimony from the, the companies. Yeah. Um, uh, on that, mm -hmm. yeah. Certainly. But they, they obviously have internal thinking that they don't want to share with the public. Right, but they can, you know, explain. Uh, uh, I'm sure there's a lot they can say. Yes, in, in general. And I think it would be a very good discussion to have. It would be good for us to hear that. I'm not suggesting that we're coming close to a, a closure on this, but one thing that I would want to find out if, is if anybody is quite uncomfortable with the philosophy that we have been talking about as an approach to making this decision. Because if, if somebody is quite uncomfortable with this general approach, it would be good to have some of that discussion now rather than on the day that we're trying to make a decision. And I, I, I'm not asking to put anybody on the spot. But, Paul? Uh, I just want us to be cautious about not coming up with a number because <laughs> that's going to leave us more confusion than anything else. I mean, we, we have to come up with a bright line or a moderately bright line somewhere or else industry is going to have a problem with dealing with it in terms of what's going to be in their product. The the, the other communities which are concerned will have a problem dealing with what do we mean by the certainty that we're ascribing to this. It's, we have to just sit down and think hard. And I'm not asking for an answer now. I'm just saying that, that 
as we go along these de deliberations, we have to really consider what it is we're going to recommend and how, what form we're going to put the recommendation in so that it's understandable to all those on each side of the issue. Right, so well, I, sec I second You're that. Right. Um, yeah. Even if, you know, it may be that there are parts of this where we can have numbers and other parts where we can't. Right. Andreas. Can, 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 can I just urge you to look at this uh, NAS report, Signs and Decisions? This is very helpful to us. Uh, uh, they, they've, and I don't think we can afford falling, falling back behind that standard and level of discussion. And I sympathize if we can, I'm, I'm the last to be against uh, coming up with numbers, but my prediction and my feeling is that we are not going to be able to do that and we have to deal with this in some other ways. That's not to say we're going to um, be unable to come up with useful recommendations. I don't think that, but uh, they're probably not. We have to brace ourselves for the possibility that these are not going to be numbers necessarily. Or maybe at the moment I would uh, like a plea here to say let's keep this open and mm -hmm. let's keep suitably flexible before okay. closing doors on certain I thoughts. Agree. Yeah, that's, I think that's good. I think most, all of us probably have been in these committee situations where we're trying to avoid a bright line because people, some people don't like bright lines. But one alternate to that is high, medium, and low con levels of concern. Well, there are just as many people who find that useless to have some committee that understood what a low level of concern meant the day that they talked about it, but there is no way to explain to anybody else how this translates to any other decisions. So are there any alternates, are there any other ways to do this? We have a bright line and we have high, medium, and low level of concern. Is there any better way to do this for those of you who have done more of this than I have? Yeah. Neither do I. Well, then we're not going to lock us into one or the other, we're, we, but we're mindful of this. Let's leave our options open and yeah. do the best we well, can. Yeah, I mean, we we know it's not perfect, and part of the problem is we know the limitations better than the audience does. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I I just don't know of a better way to do it. And in terms of uh, justifying a recommendation, if if the deci if the recommendation will be to take some regulatory action, um, you know, some kind of quantification a hazard index or something, um, even with the uncertainties, is, it, you know, makes it a, a much stronger case. So for your purposes, you don't want us to necessarily be satisfied with a high, medium, right, or low right, level of concern. Right. You need more than that. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I, I would think so, yes. Because we're not going to make a decision. We're only going to make a recommendation. True. And you're the one that has you're, to take... Well, you're going to make a decision to make a... Rec no. Yes. You're going to make a recommendation. Um, in fact, I will make a recommendation, and the five commissioners will make a decision. Okay. And that decision, obviously, has to do with parts per million in a product. Uh, ultimately... Too high or... Yeah. Ultimately, uh, yes. What other things would be good for us to discuss today on this topic? Um, I mean, I, I, I think uh, after the meeting, one of the things uh, I could draft something up uh, for a federal, an announcement of the next meeting and say we're looking for testimony on these topics. Um, and share it with the panel so you could mark it up or whatever. I think that's something we would want to do as soon as we can. Uh, and then as far as uh, questions for the speakers, I've already jotted a few things down and we can continue yeah. to expand that. I'm, I'm assuming that that's another part of this discussion that's going to follow. So I'm, if, if I'm sounding like I'm coming to a closure on that, I didn't mean to. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Russ. One, oh, one thing we might want to ask EPA, and they give a presentation, is what level of analysis they may be able to provide on these other sources of phthalates. And it includes food, dust, and other and it, food pathway, inhalation pathway, and dermal. That, since they are doing something, it's important, I think, to get an idea of where they are in the process, what they can be able to provide us, and at one point in our process, we may be able to see something that we can use effectively in terms of dealing with some of these issues. Yeah, and I'm not sure exactly. I, I am going to meet with them in a couple, in a week or two. Um, I'll see what uh, I can get about where they are in their process. But they're, you know, like us, they're in, well, the ones who would be looking at exposure, OPPT, is in a regulatory mode. So they might not be able to share share a lot of things. I don't know, but. Well, who's going to be doing the analyses? The, um, well, they, they got. The exposure sessions in Washington four, or in, uh, in RTP? Well, they've got four, at least four programs looking at phthalates right now. IRIS, which is right, the, but just the risk exposure. part, that's the risk. not exposure. Right. OPPT is looking at potential regulation, so they'll look at everything. They're going to look at the exposure assessment. I, I think clearly we need to have some information from them. Yeah. And what they're going to be able to, what they're doing, what the level of uncertainty of their data is, and how that can be useful to us. And the sooner we get that, the better. Yeah. Well, I have a feeling they're saying the same thing right now that they need to get all the information they can from us and from the chap. <laughs> oh, okay. But we'll see. We'll find out. Russ? Actually, it was. Uh, Pretty much the, the same thing Paul had said. I guess we were having telepathy, uh, but I, I was just thinking in terms of a bookmark again for you know EPA as we're talking about information that we may want to get and pretend potentially someone to visit us, you know, visit with us in July. So just in, to make sure that that was yeah. on our on Absolutely. our list. Well, we can we can ask uh, uh, someone uh, from. Iris and or OPPT to come and talk to both. Yeah, they're two different processes. One which Abs deals absolutely. One which is dealing with the questions that the Burnt was raising, and the other one's the questions that Holger and I and Russ have just raised. Right, a a uh, absolutely, and uh, we'll invite both. Just to complete the regulatory survey, is there anything that we need from? Does the FDA regulate phthalates in a way that would be helpful to us? Uh, well, uh, they have uh, authority over, you know, food contact articles, cosmetics, uh, medical devices, and there are, we can certainly um, in, invite them to come as well. Uh, wait, who have I been talking to? I've been talking to, well, CIFSAN, which includes uh, Cosmetics um, and food packaging, I guess, are the main uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, the main groups. Um, I mean, we can invite medical devices, uh, but that's kind of it, it's such to me such a narrow a narrow group. Um, uh, that to uh, me be a low low priority. The well, unless there are pediatric to... devices. Well, I mean, there there, there are in 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 you know little kids. Uh, who have to have major surgery or even preemies? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they they can have a, a, a very intensive exposure, but risk benefit. There's a you know it's a whole different, a different balance. Issue. It's a risk benefit consideration. The other con reality <clears throat> is if you want some information from several different centers in the FDA, you have to invite several different people. It's hard to find somebody who can speak for the whole FDA. That's true, but uh, also we can. Um, we'll, we'll talk. Uh, I'll talk to them and see what they, how much they have, because okay. I don't know how, how much they they really have that can be helpful. Um, Andreas, uh, 
can I suggest um, to invite someone from the Committee on Improving Risk Analysis uh, approaches oh, yeah, yeah. from the National Academy of Sciences that report? Uh, sure. Thomas uh, Berkey chaired this. He's from Johns Hopkins, round the corner. Yeah. I think that might be helpful uh, yeah, what, information. What, what was his name? Berkey. Tom Berkey. Burke. Tom oh, Burke. Tom Burke, yeah. yeah. Tom would be more than one in the country. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's good. But give him and they have uh, really made specific uh, recommendations to EPA, so I think we could utilize that, really. Which questions would you want to ask them in dreams? Because this he, would be more this would be more board. meta meta or uh, concerning a framework or approach uh, to to this issue, which we could use. They've uh, they have a wonderful uh, uh, decision tree or matrix mm -hmm. kind of stuff developed. Uh, I think it would be helpful. It would uh, it would not help us to address directly any questions uh, related to phthalate health risks, but it would help us uh, how to frame the problem, how to go about it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That part of the science and decisions? Yeah. That's right, yeah. He chaired that committee. <clears throat> Is that on the in one of the disks, Mike? Uh, it's, it's not, but I could look certainly look into getting it. I think that... I have it on my computer. You can have a copy straight away. In fact, um, I'll play it onto my brain, shall I? But with, with that report, the, I think the critical questions that I would like to see is, and they have the decision tree, but how do they deal with the decision tree in, deal, in, in, in approaching the mixtures question that we're really seriously going to have to, have to deal with? And I think that that's the kind of framing of the discussion I think we'd like to have with with Tom so that he at least knows where we're coming from and what our critical concerns are you know the endpoints how you go in extrapolation endpoint from reproductive to uh, to, to early childhood the questions of um, uh, the mixtures how do you put it into something that can be quantifiable I think is a good point from for departure with for him because I think it's something that you've been you just articulated a little while ago, you're going to struggle with. Well, I've got the report. I have a copy. Got there. the book. Got the book. Uh, your emails are in there. Uh, there. There is a page somewhere with con to everybody's emails. Yeah. Let me find out where we are. I, <clears throat> I think we're done with the discussion about acceptable risks, and we've now morphed into this issue of what data do we want for the July meeting. And I don't know if we're done with that discussion or not yet. Uh, you had a, a list of questions that you're going to distribute to each of us for uh, further input. Yes, I think I... See, here it is. Uh, I, I just jotted these down while we were talking. Yeah. Um, and we'll... I'll share this and we'll add to it or whatever, mm -hmm. refine it a little bit. Uh, these are just some bullets. Uh, we'll try to frame specific questions for, like, Jeff Peters and Paul Foster and so on. Yes. So some of these will have specific individuals attached yeah. to them. Yeah. And we're hoping that people who aren't experts behind these questions won't attempt to answer them. Yeah. We just don't have time, you know. But in addition, you are going to be contacting a broader list of people on a standing list well, you're going to announce. We'll, we'll invite those particular, the specific people that you requested. We'll also uh, just publish a federal register yes. notice and something on our website, uh, asking, uh, inviting people to present testimony. Um, probably, some of the people sitting here today will be presenting testimony. 
um, um, we can expect uh, uh, people representing the, manuf the phthalate manufacturers and so on, substitutes, uh, um, as well as others. Uh, so um, we will do that, but we can frame some specific questions for them, like if you ha uh, we can ask about substitutes, uh, for example, uh, what the process is that they go through, um, what are the considerations, um, and, you know, I'll draft something up, uh, uh, I, or I could unless you wanted to take the first stab at it, uh, but I could draft something up like, you know, we've done for other meetings, uh, start with that. Um, and share that with you. Yeah, I think, I, Mike, I think that's a helpful way to proceed. So if you, you want you me to much take more. the first crack at it. Yep. And then we, we uh, give our input. Okay. I mean, I, I, if, as long as that's okay, I just offering. Is there something more that you need from us today to be able to do that? Today, you know, uh, I don't think so. I think I'm in pretty good shape as far as that goes. Um, I'll, you know, draft stuff up and circulate it, and I'm sure, uh, you know, the panel will have a lot to add, um, um, and so on. Uh, but we'll get started on that, um, planning that meeting soon. Okay. Any Ross. I just had a, I guess, a question in, in terms of staging of this. I mean, because it, it seems like there's a lot of people and information we've listed. Would it be, you know, information overload for July, and then we're going to come up with some new questions and needs for our next meeting, which would be in the fall? I mean, is should we, because it sounds like there's like five to eight or more presentations that we may have. Uh, you know, I is mean, it going to be too much? I was wondering about that. And would you want to break it up? Uh, have the public testimony in July, and then the scientists, the invited speakers at the subsequent meeting, or vice versa. Um, it's something, something to think Us. about. Mm. I, I think we want we want input from the experts as possible and if we have to have but I do think we want the public input too as soon as possible also so it could this just could be a data dump July yeah but I'm just wondering if you know if it's two days of full days of presentations it doesn't leave us a lot of time and then we're probably going to come back with you know other needs I don't know I'm just thinking in terms of we may want to prioritize I don't know well, I think we can try it. In, in, yeah, I think last time we had, you know, a day of public testimony. And so if we have uh, end up with a day and a half uh, of listening, I don't think that's too intolerable. Um, uh, Digesting the information. Yeah, yeah, to have yeah. to, so, you know, not that they'll, you know, they, they to dump all this information on us and then we leave a few hours later, but we, I think, would need time as a panel to I think the, you know, digest it. The so. talks, uh, the actual presentations, you know, we can keep them, limit the time. Um, and they, you know, can submit lots of data and give a, a short summary. Um, Mike, how about if you would put together an agenda okay. for these public testimonies, both scientists, yeah. EPA, FDA, and the general public? And it, with some times associated with that, yeah. and then we can start to... We can do that. I mean, the, the only thing is we don't know how many people are going to want to give, present, until we yeah. ask. Yeah. Um, but we can put together a, uh, a, a straw man or something like that. Say that, um, you know, we like... Earl Gray to, to just talk with us for an hour, not necessarily present for an entire hour, but have a, a dialogue going on. Uh, maybe that's not enough. I don't know, but um, well, maybe have the three experts for a dialogue. 
exactly. for an hour. Yes. Yeah. That would that be might more, even be more. That fruitful. would be more effective at the same time. At yes. the same time, because then we won't have to. I like that. Ask the same questions yeah. over and over again. We have these three very competent people in the room. We want to just get a information exchange. Yes. Then we will need to take a more active role in the moderation of that discussion. Yeah. So that we don't, we're not here at six o'clock in the evening from nine o'clock in the morning listening to those three people yet. Yes. <laughs> but we could we could devote an entire morning to those folks. And maybe the afternoon to um, from EPA, FDA, and again have them. IHS, those three. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I would also just caution to make sure that there's time for us. So if, if they present all morning, you know, block out two hours so we can talk about what they presented rather than oh, yeah. yep. two right. days straight and then we all come together on the third day and we don't remember what, yeah. Right. If we can't internalize it, it won't be of much help to have them come and just talk to us. Have a block of time for us after each. So, so the type of three coming for two hours and then we block another hour where we sit and talk about what they told us. That would be good. And then have EPA and FDA and NIEHS talk. Block of time. And block, have a block of time at the end of that for us to talk. That, that would be fine. Now because that will be an open public meeting, <clears throat> we may have two hours of them answering our questions, but then they'll sit in the audience and hear what we say about it. Yeah, that's and that, that's and the way it is. Follow up. That's a public meeting. But I mean, there you, uh, the you know the chairman. I mean, you're you're inviting them. Uh, you know, they could sit at the table if that's what you want and participate in the discussion for as long as you want. Um, so, are we talking about like having the uh, the invited speakers on the first day. How do how do we want to do this? Well, I won't be here on the first day. Yeah. Remember, so it's up to you guys. I'll put them on the second morning. Yeah. Okay. Come here. Public comment the on the first morning. Okay. Federal agencies in the afternoon. And the experts on the Monday morning or the second day morning. I've just emailed everyone the report. So, Phil, I think maybe we're, we're done with this piece. I'll turn it back to you. Free lunch? Well, I think it's time for lunch. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. That was an easy one. <laughs>